there will be an artist reception for the current Town Hall Walls exhibits, uh, some of which you will see on the wall in this room. Um, they feature watercolors by Judy Mason, paintings by Natalia Shaparovsky, and photographs by Jean Stringham. Uh, some are here, some are downstairs in rooms 103 and 111, is that right? Um, anyway, there'll be a reception from 5 to 7 p.m. on Friday evening where you get to meet the artists. And just a reminder, the deadline for applicants for the spring Town Hall Walls exhibit is December 14th. You can get forms and details from the um, Brookline Council for the uh, Commission for the Arts website, and you can also <coughs> find out by calling 617-730-2135. Uh, just uh, also repeat reminders, there will be a holiday marketplace again with pop-up vendors at 2 Brookline Place in Brookline Village on Saturday from noon until 5 p.m., and the Winter Farmer's Market will continue on Sundays from noon to 5 p.m. in the Arcade Building in Coolidge Corner. Any additional comments from members of the board? No, I just no. want to say um, that, because that, I don't think we've commented on it since it's happened, but um, I was in Brookline Village on First Light. Oh, yes. Like a lively um, scene. So um, that, was, uh, that was very good. Good. And I notice if you look around town, there are, are all kinds of nice lit up trees, yeah. which is, to me at least, the <laughs> really a significant thing get the lights back on, folks. It's <laughs> too dark at 4 p.m. So anyway, all right. Um, moving on to our miscellaneous calendar. Are there any corrections or changes to the minutes? I Did have uh, some. OK, I'll pass them in. Um, then I move, and we had already agreed uh, to corrections for the minutes from November 20th. So these are the minutes from November 26th. So I will move that we approve the minutes from November 20th and November 26th as amended. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. <coughs> and moving on to our miscellaneous items. Just make sure I've got the right calendar in front of me. Uh, we have some contracts. Uh, first, wastewater master plan update, and I wonder if we're going to have anybody here to comment about that. Maybe we'll, I actually have some questions, so could we move ahead and if yeah, maybe we Mr. Can. Yeah, Huckner we can, can tell us about the bicycle issue, and then we can come back to. Um, are you s are you also holding the transportation improvements at the Hammond St Street Fire Station number six? Um, that's the second. I, yeah, I do have some. You have questions about that I one, too? I do have some questions about that one. All right, then we'll move, skip to item D, and perhaps either Selectman Wyshynski or Mr. Kleckner would tell us oh, the status of this. Yes, Mr. Viola. Is well, so yeah, I asked <laughs> Joe if you could come up and okay. clarify. I'll give you the, just the very okay. thumbnail sketch, and that is that you may have read that the uh, city of Cambridge would like to experiment with winter operation of the hubway system. Uh, the original agreement did not contemplate that. And so obviously if there's revenues that are accruing um, in the winter for operation, uh, the allocation of those revenues need to be adjusted. And that's essentially what, what the amendment uh, reflects. But uh, perhaps Joe could, could clarify. Further. Sorry, Mr. Viola. Uh, Mr. Collector is correct, obviously. And in addition to that, it just, it's the amendment gets into uh, certain aspects of expenses and how they're borne exclusively by Cambridge as part of its uh, winter operations of the bike share system. Um, just to be uh, an update is all, all four communities and all the bike share review reviewed and agreed to this amendment. Uh, the communities are supportive of Cambridge and its venture. Um, and it'll be good to see whether or not uh, the bike share system is viable as a in winter operation. Time, yeah, right. So, is there any opportunity for other communities to kind of test the waters in addition to Cambridge? I guess our, our equipment's all going to be taken away, though, right? Our equipment, as of yesterday, is actually is off the street. Yeah, right. And Boston's in the process of taking their systems, and right. Somerville as well. So, none of the other communities are choosing to participate. 
uh, Cambridge is the is the sole uh, leader pick. operation. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. so watch. then we we observe them closely right. and find out right. how successful are they. Yeah. Exactly. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I've got to say I I was wondering about this because I um I I see that in their agreement they were having. Alta was supposed to come along and pick up the bicycles before a major snow event, if possible. But it seems to me that in the last, I don't know how many years, we've had a fair amount of snow every winter. And to try to deal with those bicycles yeah. out there and then plows kind of hit them and, mm -hmm. you know, you there's damage and so on and so on. The bicycle racks? Well, but, you know, th that, I mean, if when do you put them back after a major snow event? I mean, sometimes we have, you know, kind of it starts snowing and then it just keeps going. So I, I, I'm, I'm happy, it's basically what I'm saying, I'm happy to let Cambridge try this out and see how right. it works before um, we get into some of those issues with mm -hmm. the plowing and everything. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I also think that um, we're, we're dependent on Boston doing it because, um, I think a lot of our trips either start in Boston, come over, or start in Brookline and go over to Boston, uh, more so than the other municipalities. Mm -hmm. So uh, it makes absolutely no sense for us to be doing it alone as Cambridge is. Mm. Um, um, but I'm very happy to let Cambridge try it try out. Try it out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll stay tuned and see what it ha what happens. Um, <coughs> then I move that we approve an amendment to the Regional Hubway Bike Share Agreement to accommodate a winter trial operation in the city of Cambridge. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Um, Mr. Let's Ditto, see. Mr. Ditto are you going to tell us about wastewater master plan and Hammond Street improvements? Sorry for being late. Um, okay, the first one on okay. the agenda is a um, approval of a contract for uh, wastewater master plan update and uh, infiltration and flow analysis and ultimately a sewer system rehab contract. And this is focusing on what we call NI area 9, 10, and 11. And NI stands for Nut Island, in case you care to know. <laughs> and um, this uh, project is funded through the State Revolving Fund, which is administered by the MWRA. And it's a 45% grant, 55% zero interest loan. And uh, just to give you an idea, we started this program up in the Chestnut Hill area, rehabbing the uh, sewer mains in that part of town and now we're working our way down to uh, this contract actually is will be the north side of Beacon Street from uh, Corey Road down to Winchester. So that's the area that we'll be focusing on uh, doing some evaluation work. <coughs> okay, and out of curiosity, are there um, <coughs> areas, are, are there, are, are you aware of any particular concerns in that section? Um, this contract starts out with doing video of mm -hmm. areas where we have the large sewer right. mains where right. uh, if they do fail, they could be catastrophic. So what we do is we, we, um, we prioritize them in size and in location. So if we have a 18 inch water main on Beacon Street, I mean sewer main on Beacon Street, we're gonna look at that first. So we, we video all the, uh, the mains in priority Order and then based on that result of the video, we determine whether there is excessive infiltration into the pipe, that's groundwater that gets right, through the right. cracks in the pipes, or if, if there are any visual structural deficiency, deficiencies in the pipe, which should be corrected. Okay, second Daly. Yeah, um, the, I had a question, because uh, since this was concerning the wastewater master plan, is there, uh, there was, I was recently hearing something about Willow Pond. Is that all sorted out? Willow Pond, there it, we're still working on that. Uh, that's a uh, DEP uh, hazardous waste site. Right. And uh, we're working at getting a cleanup program in place for that. Okay, so that hasn't happened yet. Are no. we, are, are, is any wastewater going into Willow Pond? No. It should not be? No. No. 
Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Ditto? Then I move that we award and execute contract number PW14-22 wastewater master plan update infiltration and inflow investigation and sewer system rehabilitation in the amount of $152,085. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. Okay. And the next item, Mr. Ditto, um, you w can you tell us about the um, extra work order? Sure. At the Hammond Street transportation improvements. Yes, this was a, uh, a uh, upgrade of the traffic signal at uh, Hammond Street Fire Station, number six. And uh, we completely did the traffic signals over there. And in installing, uh, in case you haven't been by, I'm sure you have, but there's a, a new mast arm up there. And that takes a uh, foundation that's about that wide and about this deep. And where we thought we could put the foundation, there was uh, an electric high voltage lines that ran right through the where we proposed to put that. So we had to do some test pitting to find out where we could fit it in. So this was all uh, a result of that investigation. Uh, and okay. so, so it's already been done? The work. Yeah, this yeah. actually finalizes Pretty that minor. contract and okay. closes it out. Okay, all right. Since we're talking about traffic circles, what do we know about the status at Putterham? Are, are, are people getting around it now these days? The horse trains. Uh, sorry, horse trains, yeah. Yeah. right. Yeah, as far as I know, it, it's worked very well. Um, we haven't heard any complaints. Well, and it still has some weird markings. Mm -hmm. It does, it does, they're different. Uh, but you the know, biggest I, I, s I, I do not believe that anyone looks at a squiggle that goes all the way around <laughs> that seems to be telling you to go the wrong way around the circle and thinks, oh yeah, that, that means something different. I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there's some universal signals, and I don't think those are on that list. Okay. Well, they are. I beg to differ. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, the, the uh, problem I've area I've driven in a lot of countries and a lot of places in this country, and I've never seen that stuff before. <laughs> oh, I, I saw oh, one you know Island, uh, last, oh, yes. last week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> one place. Mm. But the, the real uh, problem area was the West Rochley Parkway coming in from um, Grove Street. And that was backing up quite a bit, al almost to the point where it was intersecting. Right. Well, it was intersecting with Newton Street. Uh, and that has seemed to have gone away. Hmm. So uh, we're pretty happy with that. All right. I w uh, but I was, on the to get back to Horace James for a minute, I was there not too long ago. And there was a long, long line of traffic from LaGrange, I guess it was, trying to get into the circle. Right. I mean, way longer than anything I saw prior to them fixing. I'll, I'll use quotation marks when I say fixing uh, that circle. Yeah, that, that historically has been uh, backing up at least as far almost to the town line. That in, in Newton Street, not as bad, but Newton Street went as far back as Princeton Road. And that was pretty much what we noticed before we started that construction. Well, I mean, I thought we were going to reach out to the state and ask them to to take a look at this. Uh, as Has far as doing a pre and post investigation? Well, yeah, the, to see if this, I mean, I don't think this is the best they can do, honestly. Well, uh, we can ask them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I know Andy sent a letter. He did. Oh, are we and was there any response we're, to no that? No, no, we're not talking about Horace James. Okay. We're, we're, yeah, we we're on a side. No, <laughs> no, we've asked, we've asked Mr. Yes, we are talking about, about it. Horace it's not James. a vote we're taking. We just happened to have Mr. Ditto present and we're able to ask some questions. Yeah. There, uh, there have been changes at Horace James. Hmm. Are, have you spoken about those? Yes. Uh, uh, since, since, uh, since the letter? Since the letter, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah go ahead. Um, the, um, and I, I apologize for being late. Um, if you remember when we had the, the hearing here with regard mm -hmm. to uh, Horace James, um, there were a couple of issues that were raised, but the, the uh, most severe backup was um, the backup uh, along uh, the parkway leading into the circle. Um, and actually, I guess that it, it was backed up to Newton Street 
uh, backed up about 1,000 feet to Newton Street. There are also backups on LaGrange. And um, one of the um, uh, solutions that I suggested was having a dedicated exit ramp off of the parkway onto Hammond Street northbound. Um, uh, Andy Papasturgeon wrote the letter to the state. Uh, subsequently, um, uh, the engineering department here um, uh, drew up plans for that to create that exit lane uh, directly, that dedicated exit lane directly onto Hammond Street. And um, the engineering department here got permission from the state to do that. And the town actually implemented that change. Um, correct? Uh, mm -hmm. So now, instead of there being uh, two lanes leading from the park, essentially as you go past the entrance to the golf course, mm -hmm. um, there were two lanes and the bulb out that basically forced everybody, no matter what direction they were going, into those two lanes. There is now a lane that uh, allows traffic that wants to head onto Hammond Street to go unimpeded. There are basically three lanes that lead into um, the, um, the circle. One of those allows traffic to go unimpeded onto Hammond Street without waiting for the traffic that's trying to go across Horace James Circle. My understanding is that that uh, has made a significant difference. And, and I also reverse commute past that in the morning on my way to school, and I've, I have not seen backups on the parkway similar to what there were before. Um, Correct. I don't know whether you've measured it, uh, but I, I mean, I, I actually, um, uh, I'm, I'm sort of pleased that the suggestion worked, and I also give a great deal of credit to the uh, town DPW and engineering department for basically just doing doing the, 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 the plans for that and getting permission from the state to do it uh, and basically uh, addressing the issue on our own. Okay. Any I don't, so comments? That's an or? update on Horace James. Yep. You hit the nail right on the head. Um, we prepared the plans according to the MUTCD standards, which is what the DCR requested of us. We forwarded them to them and they said fine. These look like they meet all the requirements. Go ahead and move ahead. So, so we did. Now, I, that, that does leave the question of LaGrange Street. Um, and, um, you know, I know that Selectman Goldstein specifically raised the question of traffic from LaGrange uh, trying to get around the circle, essentially being uh, forced into one lane uh, to, to make that. Um, I don't, I, you know, as I, go around the circle again in the morning. I, there do seem to be backups on LaGrange. I don't know how serious they are. How, you know, I, I, I don't go that route, and I don't know whether there's so a potential fix for that. Has there been any um, official monitoring or even unofficial monitoring since those changes were done? I would say at best they were unofficial by the uh, DPW, and that was just a case of riding by during the peak hour and mm -hmm. seeing if there was any backup. And we hadn't noticed it for two days in a row. Let it go, and if we got any complaints, we'll address them. Okay, and how long have the changes actually been on the ground? I'd say about two weeks, maybe. Two yeah, weeks, I yeah. think that's right. Well, maybe it'd be nice to have somebody um, officially from the Transportation Department go out and just do some tr rush hour monitoring to see yeah. whether it's been effective. We can do that. After two weeks, people have maybe had enough time to figure it out. It's different. Okay, uh, back to our original item, which is to approve the extra work order. <laughs> uh, I move that we approve extra work order number one in the amount of $1,578.33 uh, in connection with contract number PW12-16, Transportation Improvements Project, Hammond Street at Fire Station number six. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Finca, are you abstaining or you want to um, vote? <laughs> I've, I've actually read the papers. I'll vote aye on it. Okay. Selectman Finca says aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ditto. 
Uh, now we have a request for extended hours at the Fine Wright Grill for one night, um, December 6th from 11 p.m. until midnight. Are there any questions about that? If not, then I will propose that we uh, approve E, F, G, and H, which all have to do with um, licensing and hours. Um, I move that we approve the request of Vine Wright Grill, holder of a seasonal all kinds alcoholic beverage license as a common victualler for an extension of hours on December 6, 2013 from 11 p.m. until midnight. I move that we approve the application of Boston University Metropolitan College for a temporary wine and malt beverage license to, for an event on December 17th, 2013. I move that we grant a temporary wine and malt beverage license to Brookline Access Television on December 5th from 5.30 p.m. Uh -huh. until 8.30 p.m. And I move that we grant a permit to serve wine and beer, non-sales, to the Lars Anderson Auto Museum on December 19th from 5.30 p.m. until 10.30 p.m. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Binka. Aye. Selectman Mashinsky. Aye. Chair votes aye. Okay, I believe now we can move to the main calendar items. And the first is uh, transfer of land at Kerrigan Place, and I know, Selectman Benke, you had some questions about this, and I don't know if we were able to address them. I so, Mr. I Martineau, are you aware of the issues that were raised in the language by Selectman Benke? Uh, yes, I am. Um, oh, okay. Town. Actually, there's somebody there who's got, okay, all right, good. Uh, I mean, you're just not the attorney, that's all. <laughs> I apologize. On, play one on TV. <laughs> okay. Um, Special <laughs> Town Council will address okay. uh, Selectman Banker's uh, issues that were brought up. Very good. Today. Then we may proceed now that I know we have all of our people assembled. Go ahead. Uh, Andy Martineau, Economic Development Planner for the town. Um, pleased to come before you tonight with a proposal for limited service hotel at the 111 Boylston Street site, also known as Red Cab. Um, it's an exciting project for EDAB. Uh, something that's been a long time coming, and we think it's going to have some, some great benefits to the town in the way of additional tax revenues and also hopefully serve as a catalyst for uh, redevelopment along the Route 9 corridor. Um, the developer has been extremely responsive to residents, uh, abutters, uh, during the entire process going back to their first meeting in June. Um, as a result, they've had a very successful and positive DAT review process, working hand in glove with members of the DAT and the planning board uh, to put forth a, a great project uh, that is poised to receive all their permits this Thursday at the Zoning Board of Appeals hearing. Um, so we're here tonight to take care of hopefully a, another important step in the development process, which is the transfer of a small town-owned parcel at the end of Kerrigan Place. Um, so you have in your packet for you tonight uh, some documents pertaining to that transfer, uh, including a tax agreement, uh, purchase and sale agreement, which includes uh, several supplement documents, um, and a deed to the parcel. So with that, I'll turn it over to Special Town Council, Jennifer DePasso Gilbert, to uh, walk you through the particulars of those documents. So welcome back. Thank you. It's it's wonderful to be here. You must have missed us on <laughs> Tuesday <laughs> night. Just can't stay I away. Really, I really did, actually. And I, I even said, oh, I'm, this is going to be my uh, first time not at town meeting. This is Ooh. terrible. I actually missed town meeting. And <laughs> <laughs> someone over in a corner office over there said, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, pleased to be here, a special town council. So just a bit of a history on this site. I think it was back in 2005, 2006 that we started talking about what was going to happen to that site and how it could be developed uh, uh, for both in the best interest of the town and also to satisfy uh, neighbors. And if, if there's any site in town that you ca could call blighted, um, that's really been it. And it's been an eyesore and, and a source of much contention. But um, in 07, we went to town meeting uh, to get authorization for the Board of Selectmen to sign a deed transferring a very small parcel of land, 502 square feet, which abuts actually the train tracks, and it sits um, to the east of Kerrigan Place, which is a private way, and to the west you have a three-family house there, and then you have the bridge that 
Davis Path and the bridge that goes over to White Place. And then, of course, you have the former Red Cab site at 111 Boylston, which is the, the large site. <coughs> and after that, in 07, we, we had a developer on board, uh, Leggett McCall, who was going to develop that property into a combination um, medical office and uh, commercial space and on the bottom. And unfortunately, um, due to both litigation after the ZBA approval, as well as the economy tanking in 09, they lost their tenant and that deal unfortunately fell through. And then we had an another developer come a um, couple of years later, GLC, who wanted to also develop the site and unfortunately that didn't pan out. Again, there was litigation um, uh, involving a different abutter and unfortunately that didn't go through. And now, um, and here with me this evening is the attorney for uh, Claremont Suites LLC who intends to operate this as a Hilton uh, Hotel, and uh, he is here tonight. Mel Schumann is also a, a Brookline resident and very familiar with the site, so we have worked together very well. I'm very hopeful that this is the uh, final developer. Tomorrow, no, not tomorrow, Thursday evening will be the second night um, of hearings before the Zoning Board of Appeals. There has been no opposition, and um, everybody has worked really well together with the design advisory team <coughs> to make modifications. And I have to give credit to Select Mbenka and Kara Booten and their team on the zoning committee that went back and changed the zoning to include a step back provision to uh, help with mitigation for the white place neighbors with respect to the height and the bulk and the massing, visual massing of the building. So it's been wonderful. Uh, we have, um, three documents that need to be both approved and signed by you tonight, and I'll go through them, and I'll also speak to uh, Selectman Banker's concerns, all of which have been addressed. There was one remaining uh, concern, Selectman Banker, with respect to adding language in the deed. There was a concern that the title company um, would, raise a, would raise a red flag for the title company, but uh, Mr. Schumann is confident that that won't be an issue, so I actually have um, a new deed which has a provision which states reference is made to an agreement, and this is the tax certainty agreement, by and between Claremont Brookline Suites LLC and the town of Brookline dated December 3rd, should you approve it, which is recorded here with the tax agreement. By acceptance and recording of this deed, the grantee acknowledges and accepts the tax agreement and agrees that the same shall be binding and enforceable against the grantee in accordance with its terms. So that will be actually in the deed now. Uh, the tax agreement was going to be recorded simultaneously with the deed. This is an added assurance that anyone looking at this deed um, will know to look a bit further for the second document, which is what we're calling a tax certainty agreement. And that was, um, I like to take credit for that because it was sort of a think outside the box kind of agreement. With any new development, there's always a concern that it may in the future be used uh, for uh, tax exempt use. And we now have an agreement that will also be recorded in the chain of title, which requires that exact language um, to apply to all successors and assigns in the deeds if they should transfer uh, the premises or any portion thereof. So Mr. Schumann doesn't have any concern that it's not going to be used for a hotel, that it will, it will be a Hilton for many years, but there's never uh, there's never any guarantee of that, and colleges seem to be looking for dorms and looking for more facilities and more and more pushing towards, towards Brookline. We are surrounded by them, and in fact, uh, the, the Art Institute and other uni universities and schools are coming actually within Brookline. So we have that agreement. And then there is the purchase and sale agreement, which um, I want to highlight a couple of things in the purchase and sale agreement. All of these documents will be held in, ex in escrow. And the purchase and sale agreement also has the vote from the 2007 town meeting that authorizes the board to convey the property. The minimum price in that vote is $85,000. It had to be bid in accordance with Chapter 30B again for the third time, which it was. And uh, Claremont Suites was the only uh, responsive proposal. There's $5,000 uh, deposit, and the total uh, price for this parcel is $85,000. Part of the escrow provisions uh, is uh, that the deed will not be released until four things happen. Number one, a building permit is issued 
uh, for the project, and the project is that which a special permit was recently applied for, so that's clear in there. And then uh, there's a release and indemnity with respect to any environmental concerns at the site. And um, in speaking with uh, special counsel who handles environmental matters for the town, a gentleman by the name of Jeff Roloffs, who used to be at Foley Hoag and now um, is on his own in Newburyport with several other attorneys, I had him review all the documents. And so we have a release and indemnity with respect to any issues. Peter Ditto doesn't believe there is or will be any uh, concerns. There is some environmental concerns, but what we've said is that the construction loan has to cover uh, any cleanup that would be required. And before the deed will be released from escrow, they have to have their construction loan uh, in a sufficient amount to cover all of that. And then all of the parcels need to be either uh, acquired prior to or at the time of the closing and release of the escrow and also that the tax agreement uh, will have to be simultaneously recorded. And um, so that's a bit of the history, the purchase and sale. Let me go over, so I went over one uh, of your concerns, Selectman Banker, and then you had three points that you wanted to clarify. And uh, I was able to make, they were all in the tax agreement, and so I was able to make those changes and actually get the uh, new agreement to the Asse Board of Assessors who met today at 4 o'clock and uh, they had no issue and approved it and signed it. So I think Kate has the ink on the paper with the copy um, and I just want to go through those changes. So <laughs> Selectman Mecca, you wanted <laughs> to make uh, clear that in the second whereas clause to the agreement which now um, the, the actual legal description in Exhibit A of the premises already included the 502 square foot parcel, and now uh, the second whereas clause specifically includes it in the definition of premises. Okay. So we captured that. And then your second point was in paragraph number two to make it clear that uh, the voluntary annual payments to the town, should this ever be tax exempt applied to the to the premises or any portion thereof that may be used for a non-exempt purpose. So I did clarify that in paragraph one. And then in paragraph three, uh, you had requested that we add the following line with respect to, well, two things with respect to termination. Number one, if there should be any laws that materially change that materially affect uh, adversely affect either party, that party seeking terminate, that would be the party seeking termination. If a law were changed, a tax law that adversely impacted either party, they could seek termination of the agreement. But we also added a line that both parties agree that should it seek such termination, it shall prior to seeking to termination confer in good faith with the other party in an attempt to amend or otherwise renegotiate the terms of this agreement in order to meet its original intent and material benefits. And I, I, I thank Selectman Bank. I think that was um, a great idea to add that. So sit down. If there are laws that change that someone wants to get out of this agreement, sit down and see uh, if you can amend it or renegotiate the terms so that the original intent could still be met. Right. So uh, those have been addressed. And um, let, um, my, well, my concern there was that um, as drafted, uh, the, uh, the language uh, basically said that if there was any change in law or regulation that had uh, an adverse effect on either party, materially adverse effect on either party, um, even the other party could, could terminate. For example, if, uh, if uh, uh, for some reason there was an adverse effect on the town that would allow Claremont to terminate the agreement, um, which uh, didn't make a lot of sense. So I think, I, as I understand it, you're addressing that. I haven't seen the new language yet, okay. but basically this concept would apply to uh, the party that was adversely affected would be able to seek termination. Um, and then, uh, but, but beyond that, um, I w was hoping that uh, there would be language that would, I don't know if, if 
conferring in good faith in an effort gets exactly to where I want to get, or whether they're um, whether whether we could make the language stronger than that, uh, because this this agreement really Claremont is going to have the property uh, and will be building, and this agreement over the long term really benefits the town. Mm -hmm. It's not something that benefits Claremont in any way. So um, I I was a, a bit concerned about the whole concept of the agreement being terminable and uh, wondering what sort of circumstances that would be likely to occur in or that could conceivably, uh, what could conceivably cause that to occur and um, was, uh, was hoping that um, if there was some adverse impact, the, the essence of this agreement would, would, it would be incumbent or the parties would be required to renegotiate to uh, accomplish the purposes of this agreement, not just to confer in good faith, but actually to uh, to be required to amend it. Yeah, to to try to accomplish the the purposes and the intent. And I'm wondering if that, and I and I know Council for Claremont is here. Hi, Mel. Um, you understand my my issue, and you understand my issue. I do. I, I think my guess is that it's you and your Councilor. You might you might want to come to the mic. Would you mind coming over to the microphone because there are people watching or will see this video sure. and you will not be visible unless I'm, you're there. I'm happy to do that. I, I think as redrafted it does more than just say confer because the language says, um, let me just find it here, confer in good faith in an attempt to amend or otherwise renegotiate the terms in order to meet its original intent. What about to confer benefits. in good faith to amend? Just take out in the attempt. Would uh, that I work? mean, I wouldn't have a problem with that's that. Fine. I don't know. That's yeah, good. That's Sold. Fine. Okay. Good. Sold. No problem at all, and I'll, um, I will uh, run that by Gary McCabe. I don't think that will be an issue with the uh, Board of Assessors. Selectman Daly? Yeah, I, I had a thought today, and I realized I should have had this thought long, long ago in the process, but it was uh, relating again to the, t to the tax certainty thing, and I appreciate your thinking outside the box there, but it occurred to me that maybe if, if we retained ownership of the property but gave somebody a 99-year lease, that we might have more control, you know, as it changes hands over the years, um, to make sure that it, you know, because we would be, mm -hmm. we would get a lease payment, so and so in, in, so you wouldn't even need to have a big argument about whether they have to pay us taxes or not. They would continue to have to pay us a lease payment. So have you thought yeah, of that? Yeah, we, we did answer? think of that, and I'm not sure we could have got received a lease payment under for a 500 square foot piece because there were efforts made by developers to not use that piece and we didn't want to get cut out of the loop. Uh, so we, we, did, we did think about that back in 06, 07. Mm -hmm. And that's my memory of why we didn't go that route. Okay. Yeah. Are there questions for Ms. Gilbert? No? No, I, um, you know, the, the one advantage uh, obviously is that uh, that, that we had uh, with the ownership of this paltry 500 square foot parcel was that um, we had an easement from that parcel to Route 9. So, um, you know, it, it would have made very, it would have made the kind of development that's being proposed very difficult Absolutely. if we had retained ownership of that parcel and uh, retained that easement. Now, we, you know, we could have Excellent point, yes, yes. I just, um, if I could go over the vote, there was a draft vote in the memorandum, but I want to uh, uh, refine it a bit. And so really uh, what the planning department and what we're asking for this evening <coughs> are for four separate uh, items. So it would be voted to, and I'll give this to uh, Kate McGilvery in a moment, approve and execute a deed transferring a ta the town-owned parcel of land at Kerrigan Place uh, consisting of approximately 502 square feet, et cetera. And number two would be to approve and execute the purchase and sale agreement related to the transfer of the land. Number three, which will be added, is to approve and execute an agreement with respect to the tax, certain ter tax certainty of the premises. And then four would be to authorize the town administrator, Mel Kleckner, to execute and deliver any affidavit, votes, or other standard forms that fa may be requested by the title company to issue its policy of insurance and effectuate the transfer of the land, provided that the same has been reviewed by 
town council. So um, with that, if I could give um, the new deed so that we're signing the correct deed with the language referencing the tax agreement, I just want to make sure that we have that. Like Nowishinsky. Um, before we get into the formal votes, I just uh, want to say how excited I am, and I know a lot of the neighbors are, uh, about this development. It's, uh, it's been a long time coming, and I think it's great. And to, to have a development there, given the history, without any opposition by abutters is amazing. <laughs> so it speaks to the quality of the uh, of what's going on, and when when do we expect construction to start? Well, uh, unlike the tax certainty agreement, there's never any certainty in these questions. <laughs> but uh, but the hope is that sometime in the spring, we'll be able to get underway, and uh, yeah, assuming that the economy re remains strong and and things go as planned, that, uh, I think that's realistic. Wh while you're up there, I know in earlier discussions, there's been some question raised about whether the Davis Path connection could be um, repaired and improved as th a result of all of this construction that I know will take place and further disrupt it over a temporary time. Has that been discussed with well, you at all? Well, there's a requirement actually in the Davis Path zoning yeah. that a portion is a 1% uh, of the hard construction costs need to be devoted either to improvements to Davis Path or the playground. So working with the Parks Department, uh, the okay. developer will determine how So we can how anticipate that that, that, will, that will, in fact, get attended. I, I think that it will, yes. Okay. Selectman Daly, you were yeah, asking? Yeah, no, my question was, I think that you were talking about a limited service hotel, but yes. I do hope people will be able to get breakfast there because... Uh, well, it's, it's really... As a limited service hotel, yeah. it has food service, but very limited for the guests of the hotel. Right. So it will not have an operational restaurant that will be for people outside of the hotel. Right, but I mean, it's it's not. The, the people who stay there will be get getting breakfast. breakfast. Right. The people who are staying there will have breakfast. Bre okay, good. included. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And um, as I understand it, uh, perhaps a happy hour also. We shall see. <laughs> <laughs> Is that to a particular interest to you? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, yeah. that's, that's a to be discussed. <laughs> to be discussed. Not, right. not part of this document. <coughs> to be determined. It, uh, and that, that in, in some respects, goes back to the bill that is now pending on behalf of the town right. before the legislature right. <coughs> with regard to liquor licenses. So, well, if, if we're going to put in our druthers, I like afternoon tea. <laughs> I, I think any establishment that has afternoon tea is, is okay with me. I will let my client know. Yes. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, I, I actually would, would like to make a comment. Um, this really is the uh, fruition of a lot of work that was put, on, put in by uh, the Red Cab Committee. Um, and I'm I, I jotted down some names, but I'm not going to name names because I'm sure that I would omit somebody on that committee. But uh, the, the concept that the Red Cab Committee uh, came up with, um, and it, it wasn't mine, it, it, the architects on the committee came up with this idea of, uh, of a sky plane zoning that um, uh, essentially stepped the building back or, or decrease the height of the building as it approached the abutting residential properties uh, to, the, to the rear of the building and put more of the mass of the building on the Route 9 side in order to reduce the impact on the, uh, on the nearest uh, residential buildings. And it was uh, just a, a wonderful idea. And the developer, the development team has actually gone beyond that uh, in, I mean, we conceived of a, of a block, a mass behind, and the development team has actually, um, the architect for the developer has um, uh, conceived of a, of a design that has uh, three projections coming out to basically break up the mass of that, uh, uh, that building in the back that faces the residential properties. So this, um, I, I think one reason uh, that 
there is not opposition to this uh, is because there's been a lot of hard work and a lot of creativity and a lot of talent on the part of volunteers uh, in the town who served on the Red Cab Committee and uh, also uh, really uh, work in good faith on the part of the development team here. So uh, it, it is, uh, uh, I think, really the fruition of, of all that work and uh, a way to address what has been a blighted site in our, in our midst. I know Kara, is she has. <laughs> have the names and um, ah. so Dick Banker uh, chaired the committee and we had Charles Baker, John Bassett, David England, Steve Hyken, Angela Hyatt, Ken Lewis, Sergio Medigliani, Charles Osborne, Linda Pelkey, Dan Sultan, Paul Stainer, and Bill Schwartz. So thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Okay uh, are, are we now ready to take this vote? Uh, I have to say, um, just uh, sort of uh, agreeing with my colleagues, that this is a great project, and I'm sorry that it's taken such a long time, but on the other hand, it's really, really nice to have a good result, and one that we will be very pleased with when we see it all completed. So well, I that guess maybe it was worth it. that hotel tax, best of all possible worlds, from my yeah, viewpoint. Sure, <laughs> sure <laughs> absolutely. All right, um, I will... Uh, read out the votes from the memo, but I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Gilbert to give us number three, which I don't have in writing, okay, when, when we get to she it. She gave it to Kate. Oh, well, all right, fine. So, but we're gonna take four different votes, which requires four different reading. <laughs> the first vote is to approve and execute a deed transferring a town-owned parcel of land at Kerrigan Place to Claremont Brookline Suites LLC, consisting of approximately 502 square feet, plus or minus, as authorized by the vote at the November 14th, 2007 special town meeting. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. Second, to approve and execute the purchase and sale agreement related to the transfer of the land and all right, that's the second vote. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Binka? Aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Aye. Chair votes aye. And now? Um, yes, um, the third proposed vote is to approve and execute an agreement with respect to tax certainty for the premises. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Binka? Aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Aye. Chair votes aye. And finally, to authorize the town administrator, Mel Kleckner, to execute and deliver any affidavit votes or other standard forms that may be reasonably requested by the title company to issue the policy of insurance and to effectuate the transfer of the land provided that the same have been reviewed by special town council. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Benka. Aye. Selectman Wyshynski. Aye. Chair votes aye. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Good yeah. luck, you. and may your construction contracts be favorable. Um, <coughs> we uh, have a brief personnel item. Um, Ms. Dobeck can't be here tonight, but I frankly see no objection to moving ahead with this unless there's some member who wishes to hold it. Nope. Nope. Okay. Then I move that we approve a vacancy in the position of Assistant Home Care Coordinator T1 at the Council on Aging Department. Actually, maybe it's T3 if I look at the form in my packet. Well, maybe we omit that and just say just assistant. take out the parenthetical. Yeah, take out the T1 and just say the um, approve a vacancy in the position of assistant home care coordinator in the Council on Aging Department. All in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Binka? Aye. Selectman Wyshynski? Aye. Chair votes aye. And the next item is a candidate for the uh, Brookline Access Television Board. Ms. Ford? Welcome. Welcome. Would you just come over to the microphone? Sure. We, um, hi. We're, we're, 
being videoed, so we need you there in order for you to be seen and heard. By Brookline Access. I hope my hair's okay. By Brookline <laughs> Access Television, right. Your, your future, right, anyway. Great. So welcome, and please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in this. Sure. I have been in primarily marketing and business development for over 20 years and feel that I can bring a pretty strong experience and background to the board. Um, on Brookline Access TV, as we're trying to kind of move from being a hidden gem mm -hmm. to, me, to being much better known as a resource, uh, particularly in the area of educating you know, our, our young people in our community on how they can really be part of the interactive revolution and have access to media and create their own media. Um, it's a great group of people, it's a great resource, you know, I think it's a hidden resource for the town, so I've been excited about working with them. And we are very pleased with the way BAT has been able to work out a partnership with the high school. Yeah. I think the kids love it, yeah. <laughs> but you probably know that. Yeah. Okay, some questions for this board? Yes, let yeah, me go. Yeah. It was interesting because you mentioned I don't know, all the different forms of media out there now. And, and I think that almost presents a challenge. And, you, know, you know, and people have their, their little screen and you can get wonderful <laughs> things on it. And yes. so it makes it hard, I think, for, for a local access cable channel to compete in terms of you know, production value and stuff like that. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. But um, I think it's a great question. It, there was a time when producing media meant having a really expensive camera and you know really high-end equipment and a crew and, and filming and there's certainly an audience for that and a group of people that really rely on Brookline Access as a place to be able to do that and create film and documentaries and amazing educational programs you know that are being produced right here in this community. Um, but a large part of what we've been doing is also educating you know, lay people, people like myself who don't have necessarily, per, you know, professional um, background or expertise in media, but teaching people how they can do filming on small screens, you know, everything from moms who want to make great videos of their families to uh, kids that want to kind of, you know, foster an interest in producing their own media, whether it be on a high-end camera or on an iPhone. So the technique on how to do that differs by device, but the skills, the you know, aptitude for that, and I think fostering an interest in that is something you know, that we're really well served to do. Media is becoming, if not, um, you know, it's becoming even more and more interesting mm -hmm. to the broader community over time. So I feel like we actually hold a really great set of resources to help people um, evolve their knowledge. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Ms. Ford? I, I actually was just curious about uh, what Care.com does. Sure. Um, Care.com, my employer, we're the largest online destination for finding care in the world. So um, here in the U.S., we have over 8 million members, primarily families looking for caregivers, like oh. full-time nannies, babysitters, um, increasingly elder and senior caregivers, tutors, housekeepers, pet sitters, um, and helping people not only find high quality care, but background check, manage, increasingly services to help people pay for care more conveniently. Um, and we're based in, in Waltham, not too far away. What, one of the things I know about it is that um, unlike sort of Craigslist, these are right. folks who've been carefully reviewed and vetted and have a high level of confidence. Yes, absolutely. Um, there's a really large safety operation that kind of happens behind the scenes to present a really high quality network of providers. We also, though, feel that you know, care providers are just as much our constituents as families and um, parents who are seeking care. So skills training, really, you know, I'd say at the highest level, the company's goal is to professionalize the care industry and create really positive relationships between families and caregivers. So. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, not, not a, a question, but a comment. Um, sure. We, th there are not vacancies right now, according to what we have in front of us. And I'm just curious as to, as to whether there is a cap on the 
I don't know, uh, what I do know is that, and Ms. Ford may be aware of this as well, there's a, um, a, a review of the bylaws underway right now, uh, an, an anticipation in the process of the next cable um, contract that there will be changes at the board level and therefore um, it, it is quite possible that they can expand the number of members. So mm -hmm. I don't know for sure um, and I don't know whether all of the incumbents want right. to be reappointed either. Right, right. I, be so. I believe we do a vacancy for yeah. them. My, my, understanding, my, understanding. my informal understanding was yeah. that there would be a vacancy but the document that we have before us I see. just shows the current members and their terms. Okay. Uh, doesn't doesn't necessarily make that clear. I see. Okay. Um, but I do have the impression you were encouraged. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think they I knew I that there was I a vacancy. I think yeah. it's wonderful that you were encouraged, but I just wanted to note that understandable. What what is we there have in front of us doesn't indicate. We're not going to make the appointment tonight. I right. can is tell there you a follow-up action from? We, we'll we'll pursue. This. You don't want to okay. run somebody don't, over. Don't worry about <laughs> this. We, we'll 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 make sure that it's no. I wouldn't do that. Um. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I uh, hope we can find a slot for you because yeah, I'm, right. I'm looking forward to uh, Brookline's Funniest Home Videos or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's a great idea. We have a lot of ideas percolating. Well, Thank what you. I can say is that um, a couple of years ago, my family took some eight millimeter um, film that were, films that were made by my kid's grandfather um, that were family things that we had actually transferred to CD and then distributed to the family. And frankly, if we had had the devices that are around today, yeah. we wouldn't have needed to do that. So uh, the fact that you may be in a position to help train people to record these wonderful things that used to take a camera and film and processing and uh, we're really, really fortunate that someone in the family had access to that and was, was willing yeah. to do it. But now anybody could, theoretically. Yeah. So it's wow. a great idea. Exactly. Great way to archive family history. Right. Yeah. But just your speaking of that makes me think that it might be, it might be interesting. I, w I would watch. If you could team up with, say, the Preservation Commission or something and, mm. and go to some of these homes that are yeah, on the yeah, National yeah. Registry. Might, and might be interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, it'd be kind of interesting, uh, you know, the history and the architecture and whatever, and um, I think it'd be kind of a Well, I, I, I hate to, to tell family anecdotes, but I've got one more which kind of fits into that, and that is that my... We just had a, a family holiday, I think. Oh, it's yeah, right. Well, <laughs> it, it's, it, it sort of comes up, but my fourth grade great niece just did a history of the house that she lives in, her family lives in and she researched when it was built and she made a little video mm. that went along with it. I didn't yeah, think yeah, about no, this as a possibility, but it's actually just it's the kind great. of thing you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. 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 It's sort of exciting. Yeah. All right, uh, enough. Uh, thank you very much for your interest. We're not taking a vote tonight, but you will hear from us and we will definitely uh, sort out the question of um, vacancies okay, between great. now and then. Thank, thank you. you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we are now at the moment when we can open a public hearing on a grant of locations. NSTAR, Mr. Ditto. We want to dig some more holes, we'll I gather. <laughs> ah, great, very Thank helpful. You. <laughs> sort of a, a, a technical question, I guess, is aren't, are there any um, seasonal temperature issues around this kind of project that limits when the work can be done? Um, there are. If you uh, approve this uh, grant of location, um, we won't give permits until uh, first week in April. Ah, I see. Okay, so this this, this work is um, will, will be in the spring. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, you have the floor, Mr. Ditto, and your associate from NSTAR is, just identify yourself for the record, please. Sheila Gillis. Thank you, Ms. Gillis. Welcome back. Yeah, we should <laughs> have your name memorized right. at this point. Or you have your own plaque. Yeah. Um, and so I was looking for four uh, sets of grants or location here. The first one is Edge Hill Road. <clears throat> it's approximately 200, I mean 170 feet of cable and one new manhole. And then there's a uh, Columbia Street and Russell Street that's grouped in as one. And there'll be two proposed 250 feet and one new manhole on Columbia Street and approximately 555 feet of conduit on Russell Street. The third location is Golom Ave, and that will involve um, running about 282 feet of conduit. And the last location is Haw Street and Borlin Road and there'll be uh, approximately 30 feet on Haw Street and 305 feet on Borland Road. The statutory seven-day notification period was, uh, was given to all the property owners that have bought these proposed grants or locations. We do have a representative here from NSTAR to answer any technical questions. Slagman Daly. Yeah, I, I have a question. I think it's really for you, Peter. Um, this. When I look at, I'm, I was concerned about the Haas Street one because we've just done so much work down in that area of Beacon yeah. Street, and this does come right out into Beacon Street, it looks like to me. Uh, the, the yellow on my page seems to come right out um, yeah, it does. to it's the center of Beacon Street. Yep, yeah, it definitely comes into the new, new pavement. That being said, um, when we get into a situation like this where the pavement's uh, three years or, or less, uh, we like to get a curb-to-curb -curb resurfacing so it doesn't look like it's a trench that was been installed there. So we will ask NSTAR to pay, repave the street the whole way. Well, I mean, there's, so there's two issues. One is, you know, when cutting into new pavement as you, that you just addressed, but also, you know, we've had um, the, the – the neighbors who live in that area and the businesses in that area have had to put up with a lot of disruption over the last few years and, you know, have been begging us to, to please stop digging in that area. So yeah. I'm, um, how long will this portion of it take? How much disruption are we talking about for the portion that goes out into Beacon Street? I'm, I'm particularly concerned Beacon? about where it comes right out into yeah, Beacon I'll, Street. I'm, I'm trying to, um, Selectman Daly, I'm, I'm trying to. The top uh, on the, the, the last page, the last the page and the, the top, last look at the top one. Yeah. The last page. Yeah. Which is it? Maybe it's, this, it's oh, it's this is, okay, it came apart. Oh, Haas, Haas it, runs into Beacon. It seems. See, the yellow is going right out into the center of um, Beacon Street. Is it, no, it it, no, it actually it, it actually stops. Yeah. It appears to stop before the crosswalk um, yes. on the yeah. Hawes Street side of, of okay. Beacon Street. Okay. I you know that that area has. That's on the other end. That's on. You showed Beacon Street as being guaranteed. So what they did was they basically bled over it. Um, roughly at the uh, back of the sidewalk there. Okay, so it does not actually go into Beacon Street. Right. Yes. Yeah, I think. Yes, it does not. Yes, is that what you're saying to me? Not. That is yes. correct. Okay. It does All right. not. Okay. All right. All right. So what? do we have any other questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm – is this um, sort of an accumulation of work? I don't think in my <laughs> years on the board I've seen this much all at once. What uh, – or is there a, a major upgrade that's going on? What's – usually we see it for specific developments or a specific need or a specific upgrade for a property, and I'm, I'm wondering whether this is part of a, 
a more general upgrade of the system? Yes, it's an ongoing project. They're replacing all the old um, underground systems with a new, more reliable one. Um, they basically kind of started, in the different areas in towns, they kind of started with the worst areas, and they're working their way down throughout the different areas. Okay. All right. I know that some of these cables are conduits. I guess, I don't know if this is a Mr. Ditto question. Um, carry more than one uh, vendor's cables? Are any other suppliers, vendors affected by the work that's being done by NSTAR? These, these wires are in the ground, what they call split fiber, and they're basically a direct burial cable. They're not in conduit. Right. So when we replace this, they'll be just all gone. They'll be just a new conduit, and the only uh, recipient of that conduit will be NSTAR. Okay, so it's just electricity. Just electricity. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments, members of the board? Mm -hmm. This public is a public hearing. Is there anybody here who wishes to comment on any of these grants? If so, please raise your hand, and you may come forward to the microphone. Yep, you're welcome to come. You, you, you are the person, <laughs> the one, the I think. The public that all we'll be hearing All from. of you. So first, please identify yourself for the record. Myself is Edith Reed. I live on 39 Columbia Street. And uh, I'm curious about how long, what exactly is going to be happening on that street and when and stuff like that. Because I, you know, I'm clue, I, I got the. Uh, you got the notice. Exactly, mm -hmm. but I don't know exactly what's going to happen. That's okay. all I want to know. Well, here are the people who can answer your question. Columbia Street. Okay, Columbia and Russell. Okay, we will be obviously replacing the old, the old wire, and what what you will see is uh, roughly there's a trench maybe two and a half to three feet wide and about five feet deep, and it will run roughly in the alignment that you see that yellow line in the plan. And uh, so there'll be a new conduit going in and uh, there'll be a new house service to your, all the establishments that front on Columbia will have new services off this new main. Um, to give a ballpark figure um, from start to finish, I would estimate this would probably play three to three and a half weeks to complete. And uh, as I said earlier, um, we don't start this type of construction until the earliest is the first of April. Is there, is, are people gonna be able to get in and out of their driveways? Yes. Okay. All right, do you have any other questions from the public? All right, seeing none, are we ready to take votes? Maybe this is one vote. Um, I move that we approve the petition of NSTAR Electric Company for permission to construct and a location for such a line of conduits and manholes with necessary cables therein under the following public ways. Edge Hill Road. Conduit from existing MH7844, approximately 285 feet south of High Street, running southerly in a direction of 170 feet to the end of Edge Hill Road and install one new manhole. Second, Columbia Street. Conduit from existing MH4483, running southeasterly and easterly, a distance of 250 feet, and install one new manhole. Third, Russell Street, conduit from existing MH 4484, approximately 300 feet northeast of Columbia Street, running northeasterly a distance of 50, 555 feet. Uh, next, Gorham Avenue, conduit from existing MH 4171 near the intersection of Dana Street, 
running northerly a distance of 25 feet to Lincoln Road, and Lincoln Road from Gorham Avenue running northeasterly a distance of 282 feet, and finally on Hawes Street, conduit from Hawes Place, running southwesterly a distance of 30 feet to existing MH8208 on Borland Street, conduit from Beacon Street, running south southerly hence turning and running easterly at Hawes Place, a distance of 305 feet to Hawes Place, and install one new manhole. All in favor, could, please. Could you repeat that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't think I could. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Selectman aye. Binka. Aye. Selectman Go uh, sorry, Wyszynski. Aye. And the, and the chair votes aye. And next time, Selectman Binka, I'll let you do it. Okay. Happy to delegate. M Ms. Reed, if you'd like to take that map for your neighbor, <laughs> I, I, if you'd like to take that map, map for your neighbors, please do. Oh, yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. All right. Thank you both. Thank you. See you back in the springtime. Well, we'll see them out on the street. That's true. We will see them in the springtime on the street. Okay. Our next item is the tax classification hearing. Yeah, I'm just wondering. We are about a little bit ahead of time, so if you want to set up your presentation, we'll all think of things to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just wondering if all those people getting new electric service means their <laughs> assessment goes up. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> I think not. But with, with good luck, it will be improved service for them, I hope. That, that would be a, a good thing. So, Mr. McCabe, I see you have with you several colleagues. I do. I do, yes. I'd like to introduce them, if I may. Yes, please do. Let's, let's start with uh, who I am. My name is Gary McCabe. I'm a chief assessor for the town of Brookline, as well as chairman of the board of assessors. And thank you for this opportunity tonight to present tax classification options for fiscal year 14. Now, first, I'd like to introduce uh, some uh, uh, people that came with me. First is Dr. Harold Peterson, uh, who's been on the Board of Assessors uh, for uh, 20 years, nearly. Um, we uh, really appreciate Dr. Peterson's participation over uh, these many years. Um, also with us is Rashid Belosin. Uh, Rashid is the uh, Deputy Chief Assessor, uh, full-time on our staff. And the other individual is a special guest I'd like to introduce tonight. His name is Mr. Sang Hun Oh. Mr. Oh is a senior deputy director of the National Tax Service in Seoul, South Korea. Oh. He is a U.S. State Department Hubert Humphrey Fellow at Boston University, and he is currently completing a research internship with the Brookline Assessor's Office. Well, welcome to uh, Brookline, and I hope you learned something that you can apply. I have the impression that town uh, tax policy may be very different <laughs> from what you're accustomed to. Yeah, uh, my honor to introduce the panel. Would you, would yeah. you go to the oh, microphone? Oh, just come to the microphone, please. Again, uh, for your information, this uh, is being videotaped, and so if you're there, we can both see and hear you in the video recording. And this is my honor to meet with uh, members of the uh, board. And then um, this is very rare chance because uh, I don't know the, the how the the tax policy in the state level and the federal level, but it's um, I this is the very it's, it's very important to me. So yeah, it's my honor. Thank you. It's it's your opportunity to see how things are applied at the very local level. Yes. Yeah, uh, because it's my country is very small compared to out of, out of the country. We are very centralized, uh, and then uh, we are the, uh, some, bench we, w uh, we needed to benchmark some uh, st state level. It's very useful, I think that. So yeah, this is very useful experience to me, yeah. Good, Thank well, you. we're very happy to be able to have you as our guest, and I hope this experience is something you will take back with you, and it will be good for you when you get home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Duet, for that opportunity to introduce Mr. O. 
Um, he'll be with us until June. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So okay. it's m much we'll opportunity. We will see you again next week then. <laughs> 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 All right. He's living in town, experiencing that as well as uh, the work of the assessor's office. And we do spend time talking to you about state tax policy. Uh, he asked a question one day why we were having a sales tax holiday. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a good question. Uh, so uh, if I may, I uh, have some information on behalf of the Board of Assessors to present to you and then uh, briefly, um, and then uh, try to answer any questions you have uh, tonight or uh, uh, beyond tonight. My understanding is uh, that uh, the hearing will be open tonight, but that you'll consider the material and then next week, um, if all goes well, we'll have a vote. Exactly. So uh, the expectation was tonight would be for us to listen and to ask questions, and also um, if members of the public have questions, and then we'll put it on our calendar for a vote a uh, week from tonight on Tuesday. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'll proceed. Uh, from an uh, overview perspective, uh, we're, we're looking at the property tax as a way to fund uh, local government services uh, for the fiscal year 14 town budget we expect to rely uh, on the property tax to fund 68 percent of our budget uh, this graph here shows you that um, over time over the last seven years we've actually grown uh, more reliant uh, on the property tax as a percentage of our budget uh, now it's 68 percent up from 63 percent in fiscal year 07. Uh, next, we want to give you some information about uh, the uh, market uh, that's driving our property assessments. And here, this graph, uh, as well as in the material you have, uh, displays the change in what we call the median assessed value or the middle assessed value for a single family, uh, residential condominiums, two family, and three family. So the uh, the uh, Blue line is single family, oh, yeah. uh, red line condominiums, green two family, and uh, uh, orange the three family. And as you see, uh, this reaches back into uh, the mid 2000s where we had a real estate boom and rapidly increasing um, real estate values. So our assessments tracked upward. Um, and then um, a, a dip here, which is the recession, a recent recession, uh, where we had a slight decline in value over one year. Uh, but generally, uh, values have been steady to increasing. And you'll notice just, just this last year, there's been um, a further increase in assessed value at a rate greater than we've seen in the last few years. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So you know, th the trend is now uh, clearly upward in our values. Uh, this slide is a comparison of the prior fiscal year 13 and the current fiscal year 14. Uh, total values by major class of property. Um, I'll start with the residential class, which is those one, two, three family res residential condominiums, um, as well as apartment buildings or in the residential class, or any part of a property that um, provides housing is in the residential class. Our residential value for fiscal year 14 is going to be in excess of $14.7 billion up from $14 billion uh, the prior fiscal year, which is roughly a 5% increase that's primarily uh, market driven over uh, the period of 2011 to 2012, which are the market periods we study. Uh, commercial property um, has increased uh, from $1.274 billion to $1.4 billion, or a total increase of 9.23%. Um, and I want to provide you a little more detail on that change. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, the industrial class of property, which is fairly small for us, there were uh, only nine parcels in industrial class. We're actually down to eight. Uh, we lost an industrial parcel, and that's why there was a, a net decline in value. Uh, the property we lost actually had no frontage in Brookline. It was a, it was a, uh, a warehouse behind the houses on, um, in, North, uh, in North Brookline. Um, and the, the street escapes me at the moment, but it, uh, excuse me? Burndale. Uh, Burndale, Burndale Street. So it was behind the houses on Burndale Street. Uh, it was a warehouse, it was torn down, 
and is now used as a parking lot for an apartment building that was built in Boston. Uh, and the land extends into Brookline. So it's no longer the industrial parcel for us. It's a residential parcel. It's parking lot as part of an apartment building. Uh, personal property increased uh, nearly 4%. I can tell you those, those new cables and wires being <laughs> ins installed by NSTAR will indeed be new growth um, in the formula that we use for, for calculating new growth. And we'll increase so the assessment they're, for they're NSTAR. they're replacing existing. Uh, but it's a new, new property, okay. so it counts as new All growth. Right. Good, You're good, right. good, good, good. Um, and and it's, it's the formula, the uh, statutory formula, not unlike if you bought a new machine to replace an old machine, the new machine is taxable for the first time and qualifies as new growth, mm -hmm. even though it's replacing an existing machine. Um, what we do for tax classification purposes is combined commercial, industrial, and personal property. And we call it CIP, uh, which is used an acronym used for other purposes, but here it's a combined <laughs> classification purpose. Only ever so slightly confusing. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but the combined are over 8% increase, um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, as I mentioned. I'm going to go back to the commercial change in value and give you some more information about that, because unlike the other changes, it was really not uniform across the properties in that class. Um, and I'll give you some information that'll help highlight that a little bit more. If you break our commercial properties down into price quartiles, all right, so vertically, uh, the, the, the highest quartile of prop commercial property in Brookline actually increased 11% um, between last year and this year. The lowest quartile increased 3%. So you can see that the change is driven by our largest commercial properties. The middle two quartiles changed seven and eight percent. So again, that nine percent is not doesn't speak to the value change of every commercial property. Uh, primarily, again, driven by the higher valued and larger properties. Um, I also can break that down by uh, use a little bit for you. Um, office properties increased to fourteen percent. Again, driven by the larger office buildings, whereas retail increased a six percent. And other uh, classes increased um, zero per, I mean, sorry, not zero percent, eight percent. There were properties that had no change in value um, due to circumstances uh, involved in that property and its location. So again, the nine percent is not across the board. Uh, overall, our, our taxable base, our taxable property in Brookline is now $16.3 billion dollars up from 15.5 billion or overall about a 5.3% increase. You know, as reflected in that graph I showed earlier, you know, driven by one, two, three families, apartments have gone up and, and large commercials have gone up as well. Um, we we um, do look at our tax exempt property and try to maintain a value, fair value on those and that's increased a little bit more than 5% as well. Our the next slide provides a little bit more granular look at uh, some of these uh, classes. It breaks the residential down into single family condominiums, twos and threes combined, apartments, commercial, and industrial. And what this does is it takes the um, four fiscal year 14 parcel count, um, divides it into the uh, fiscal year 14 value to get an aggregate or a, a mean or an average value for that um, subclass. So single family, the average single family assessment in Brookline for fiscal year 14 be $1,375,000, which is up 3.8% over the prior year. Uh, condominiums experienced a, a slightly um, larger increase, 5.3, two and three families, 5.1, apartments, 5.8. Um, again, commercial driven by the larger commercials, uh, almost 11. And those eight industrials did increase in value, even though we lost one, um, they on average did increase. Can I just, for purposes yes. of clarification, um, ask you to say for the public um, why apartments is only 326? It certainly is not the number of units. It's the number of buildings, Properties. Right? Parcels. Right. Actually, uh, it, it could be a complex of buildings, right. but it's considered one parcel. Right. And, and all I'm trying uh, to do is just say for people who don't understand, a parcel could be 100 apartments. Yes. In one parcel, or yes. more than 100 par apartments in one parcel. Could be 400. Could be 400 mm -hmm. apartments right. in one parcel. Right. Okay. 
Um, an you know, example is uh, the apartment complex in South Brookline, Hancock Village, is four parcels. Right. Uh, but a combined total of about 400 units. Right. right. So, yes, thank you. Uh, those are the parcels, taxable parcels. Right. Any other questions on that slide? Uh, the next slide uh, highlights the growth in our tax um, base uh, beyond the market changes. So these are, this is growth due to physical changes or changes in use, uh, traditionally driven uh, by single-family permits, and that continues to be the case. So 62, nearly $63 million of new value added to our single-family homes year over year. Um, residential condominiums, either through permits or conversion, 25 million, multifamily and apartments, 29.5. For a total of $147 million of additional property, taxable property, added to the tax rolls this year, which equates to $1.9 million in additional levy growth. Um, over the prior year, that's about 1.2% of the prior year's levy. So what's happening there is in addition to um, the ability to increase our levy 2.5% over the prior year, we can increase it by this growth amount another 1.2%. And that's, that number, 1.9 million, has been fairly steady over the last three years. Fiscal year 12 and fiscal year 13 also were about $1.9 million in growth. So we've, you know, we've been consistent in that area in, in um, real estate growth. Uh, we have a question. Uh, yes. The uh, so question is, is probably more for Sean Cronin in the, in the back. What's our as growth assumption for budgeting purposes? One seven. One seven, okay. The response is <laughs> one point seven million. Yeah. So, uh, so should I share that response? Uh, the, the base projection was one point seven million dollar increase uh, plus a new property that came on the tax rolls for the first time, let me clarify that. It's not a new property, it's coming on the tax rolls for the first time. It's located at 1371 Beacon Street, right in Coolidge Corner. For the last 40 years, it's been under a 121A uh, urban um, uh, renewal, a corporate excise tax type program called the one corporate um, 121A excise. So that has expired, uh, 40 years of that term has expired and that property would be subject to uh, local real estate taxes. And that becomes growth, yes. Um, so with the total was 1.84 in the budget. So this is uh, the princely sum of $95,000 more than... Correct. Uh, yeah, than, than budget. Assumption. <laughs> than our assumption. <laughs> yeah. Oh, come on. It just says that was that well, well calculated That's assumption. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. okay. So a correction that the base was a million six, uh, adjusted for the new properties a million uh, seven four sounds like. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So one uh, one hundred ninety thousand uh, beyond uh, forecast. Any additional questions on that? Okay. The next two slides are bar graphs uh, that show us a couple things, and we look at these every year. Uh, over a period of years, fiscal year three to 13, so like a 10-year period. The larger bars are the uh, percentage of residential value, and this 90 represents 90% 90 of all um, taxable property. So you can see our residential property has been you know, a little bit above 90% of the total, uh, and has been that way for many years, uh, and you know, it's something slightly less than it was 10 years ago. Um, not because residential values haven't increased, but, but because commercial uh, industrial and personal has outpaced them for various reasons. So that's what those large bars are. The small bars are the percentage of residential levy. And those have been hovering around 84%, meaning we take 90% of the property and um, we apply 84% of the tax levy to that. That's what this classification option provides the Board of Selectmen, that you can shift about six, um, between six and 7%, where you have shifted between about 6 and 7% of the levy from the residential tax base to the commercial tax base. That's what this shows. Um, the next graph is, is the sort of the flip side of that, shows that the commercial industrial personal uh, value, which is the smaller bar, has been hovering around 9%, but the levy uh, applied to that 
um, is nearly 16%. So it's that reciprocal. It's that 6 to 7% of the levies shifted to the commercial. That's effectively what you're doing when you apply these factors of 175 or lately the 173. All right, it's not a 75% shift. It's a 6% shift or between 6 and 7 because of the percentage of the base, the tax base that these properties represent. So over time, you know, the selectmen have been fairly consistent in how they've applied this shift. Uh, the next slide uh, it tries to bring this to further light. Uh, the levy shift, again, is, the, uh, is displayed here. It's a smaller bar, the darker bar. It's a levy shift, and it's since 03 to 13. So over 10 years, the levy shift has varied very, very little, and the median levy shift over that time is 6.73%. There should be a percent sign there. Um, the, the larger yellow bars are the uh, CIP value percent. So again, our value percents you know, hovered around 9% um, over this period for commercial industrial and grown slightly. So it's slightly outpaced residential, interestingly. Uh, the next slide, a, again, a bar graph, a little more information here. So we'll take a minute to look at that. Um, the, the vertical axis is the percent change in the real estate um, tax uh, on a percentage basis if these classification factors were adopted. And what's displayed is 170 to 175, not the entire array, which is actually 1 to 175, but sort of the top end where the, the uh, selectmen have been focused on um, for over this period. Um, the bars represent single family um, in the, in the uh, blue condominiums, in the red two family, three family apartments and commercial. So all those subclasses. And what it shows is at a factor of uh, any of these choices, let's say 173, which was last year, um, this would be the change in uh, the commercial uh, tax. It would be nearly 6%. All right? And this would be the change in the single family tax. It would be less than 2%. All right? And the reason that they're not uniform is because the value, assessed values did not change in a uniform way um, from one year to the next. Commercial property, uh, property value increases outpaced residential. Right? Uh, th the, the benefit that we've had from this particular graph over the years is to sort of look at what happens when you move this decision, this factor decision. Uh, the highest factor you could adopt um, during this classification process is 1.75. And you can see that it has a larger impact on commercial, almost a 7% change. Within the ones, the numbers presented, the 1.7 factor would would apply a 4% change um, in commercial. So that's pretty significant, a 3% difference. Um, whereas on the single family, that same decision would, would shift the tax burden upward of about 2% um, on the single family, all the way down to nearly you know, 1%. So less of an impact on a percentage basis. And the reason for that is because, the, again, the commercial property is only 9% of our total. So these decisions have a bigger impact on, on uh, that, that group of properties. Uh, the next couple of slides uh, are busier uh, with uh, information on them, mostly um, data related to actual tax dollars <coughs> and percentages. Um, I will uh, bring to your attention uh, in the uh, tab three of the workbook that you have on page, uh, we're on page Six. 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 Uh, the headers that you see on, on slide 12 on page 6 and slide 13 on page 6 in your workbook um, need to be revised. That top slide is single family and two family. And I think your copy yeah. says residential condo. So yep. if you don't, wouldn't mind correcting that for me, cross out residential condo and, and put in two family. The slide below 13 becomes residential condos instead of the two family. So the two family information was moved up to the top slide to, to be a companion with the single family. I'm going to tell you why I did that. That was a recent change, and that's why we missed it on the header. And, and this is the reason. Um, for the single family and two family properties, we looked at the tax impact with the residential exemption as it's been adopted over um, the uh, last 20 years at 20% of, of the value. 
We've applied that, and the reason we did that is because 87, this little number right here, 87% of the single family homes receive the residential exempt. Right? Not 100, but 87. And on the two family, so now this data from this green bar below are related to the two family, 72% of the two family properties in Brookline receive the residential exemption. That's new information based on the questions you asked last year or the, you know, the last few years. So, so we that, added that information. Is that 72% receiving it on 100% of the two family? Correct. In other words, they have to, do they have to have family in both units? No, no, only one. So if they are living in one half of the unit, they get the benefit of Correct. the residential exemption. The entire the residential unit. exemption. Same with wow. three families. Yeah. Right. That's true of three families as well. And, and in fact, larger. You could have an apartment building where you're the owner and you live there, you still get the residential exemption. On the entire building? Wow. You get one residential exemption. Yes. But on the, on the value of the, uh, if you have a 100 unit apartment building and you're the owner and you're living in it, in one of those units, you get the residential exemption on the entire value of on that On that building. parcel, right. But the adjustment but the, yeah, the is adjustment. a uniform amount. It's right. the same residential exemption right. everyone receives. Yeah, okay. Well, that's it's not a percentage. So it's just one. It's based on yeah, a percentage, okay. and we'll I, go through I, that I, math in a minute. Right. I understand. Yep. Yeah. But the, so what this means is, you know, 72% of the two family are owner occupied. The property is owner occupied. Right. Um, so how these numbers work, and this is one of the reasons I think we take a week to consider these numbers. There, there are an awful lot of them. Um, what this says is that fiscal year 13, so we're looking at a change over fiscal year 13. The tax bill on a median single family value with the residential exemption was $10,531 last year. Now, this year, I these factors that, that are uh, presented here would tell you, uh, say, uh, what the tax would be this year. A factor adopted of 173, as we have in the last few years, would produce a tax bill of $10,682, or $151 increase equal to 1.4%. That's how you read this chart, all right? So uh, a median two-family at 173, the increase in tax would be $274, or a 2.9% increase in tax. So we're looking at, compared to last year's tax on median value. Selectman Banker. Yeah. Um, could, could this shows a median single family value of $938,000. If you go back to slide six, what are we looking at? Is that the mean? The mean is 1325? One the point the three mean with, uh, is 137 okay. without the residential exemption. Okay, so, so there are two differences between slide six and slide 13. Slide six is showing the mean value without the residential exemption. Slide 12 is showing the median value with, with the, res the residential okay, exemption. Okay, thank you. Right. And the residential exemption amount is about $175,000. I'll show you that in a minute. Right. There's additional information in your workbook in tab two, sheet A that corresponds to this slide as well. That gives you even more information about th the possible impact of various shift options. So tab two, sheet A will give you, A in the upper right-hand corner, will give you additional information that this slide um, tries to highlight. C can you go back to slide 11? Now, this is without the residential exemption. Would this chart be a lot different with the residential exemption? It would be a little different, uh, Selectman Wyshynski. The decisions we have to make in presenting the information uh, are based on this thinking, that not everyone receives the residential exemption. Right? So when you're comparing with between classes, we tend to take it away. When you're comparing within the class, we'll include it. Okay, so right. so between, it's not such a good idea to include it because not everybody gets it. Um, you know, apartments. I'll show you in a minute. Are very few have residential commercial. No, there's no residential exemption. 
that sort of thing. So right. I, I think in okay. fairness, when you're between classes, to leave it out. That's, that's our thinking. Okay. Yeah. It certainly would change if, if you were to consider the residential exemption. And we could do that if you think it would be helpful in your decision. You know, we can follow up with that. Yeah. Just let me know. Okay? So uh, where we were headed is additional information about residential condominiums, which is a significant class for us. In fact, it's the, what we call the um, predominant class of property in the town of Brookline. In other words, there are more uh, residential condominium parcels than any other property, all right? There's about, uh, well, there's over 9,000. Can, can I just yeah. follow up a, a little bit on that to be sure I understand? Uh, uh, your 62% residential exemption, therefore, means what? That many are owner-occupied? 62% are owner-occupied. Okay. When we group the residential condominiums in the three families, which are 49% owner-occupied, we left the residential exemption adjustment out. So the 447,000 is without the residential exemption. That's just how we decide to present the data. We certainly could, to, to the residential exemption is about $175,000 off of that. Now I have another slide that demonstrates that. But what would happen is this is the, uh, again, it's apples to apples because you're comparing to the same situation in the prior year. Residential condominium without the residential exemption. The, the uh, tax on the median property was $4,954. At the 1.73 factor, that would go up $132 or 2.7%. For the three family, the tax was $13,425. At the 1.73, it would go up uh, $335 or 2.5%. So those two line up fairly well on, on percent increases. Again, that single family doesn't line up with those. It, and the reason for that, the single family, you'll uh, recall, at the 1.73 was 1.4%. 1 the um, median two family was 2.9, which lines up a little better with the condos in the three families. The reason for that is that the single family homes actually lagged behind in terms of increase in value behind the residential condominiums, twos and three families, slightly, all right? As a group, the single family homes did not increase in value at the same rate that condominium twos and threes did. That's why you see a shift there to the residential condominiums, twos, away from the single family, to actually pay a lesser increase at any of these options. Questions? Um, just, just to, if you go back to slide um, 11, um, I have a feeling that there might be a little glitch in that slide. It seems to show 1.71 and 1.72 at about the same level, and I would think that you hmm. would see um, the percentage increase, in, you know, the, the commercial going up uh, in a more linear fashion rather than taking the big jump from 1.7 to 1.71 and then leveling off. Um, yeah, they look, they look a, like a mirror. I, although I'm not sure, if you look at uh, the three, no, no, two family. The three family goes down a little. I'm, I'm sort of curious though. Uh, I'll take a look at that, Selectman yeah. Banka, uh, to check the numbers behind the bar graphs and let you know uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Um, but they're not exactly the same. So I, know, I agree. Yeah, I but agree. they're very but similar. They're, they're and in fact, they're the most uniform um, changes. So Counterintuitive. Interesting. Well, the reason for that is because, again, the commercial base went up at a greater rate than the residential base. So there was this slight shift, natural or market driven shift, to commercial property uh, in this non uniform change in assessed value. Um, but, but why would the slope change so dramatically on the commercial once you hit 7.3? Well, uh, yeah, there's, there's no s very little slope between 7, 1, and 2. Yeah, th th if there's a data issue, yeah. it's probably with that yeah. one right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. Um, the, and if you go to the, to the next slides, obviously, um, and, and I don't know if there's a, s a sort of, I looked through this. Um, there is a commercial. 
Uh, I put yeah. it after the residential exemption. Yeah, the, it's, it's on, yep, okay, we're gonna get to it on 18. I am, and, and it's, I chose the order there, so me because I want to get to the residential exemption before we jump to commercial. Fair enough. Uh, because it does play such a large role. So that's what the next slide is to show you um, how the residential exemption is calculated and uh, what this, where this percentage ad adjustment comes in. So by law, this is the formula. Uh, if you're gonna adopt a residential exemption, and we have continuously since fiscal year 84 or so, it, we, the, the um, formula starts with the total residential value of 14 point, in our case, $14.7 billion. Um, divides that by the residential parcel count, which is that's 16,800, to get an average residential value based on aggregate mean. So then that is multiplied by the selected factor, which is up to 20%, to get the value of the residential exemption, which is applied uniformly to all eligible taxpayers, whether it's a single family, two family, three family apartment building. Then that is multiplied by the tax rate that's determined through the classification process. So the examples on the next slide are like this. If we had a single tax rate with no shift, it would be $12.35 with the residential exemption in place, but no classification. So the residential exemption would be that amount. 175 shift, the residential tax rate would be $11.35, and that would be the amount of the residential exemption. The 173 shift, option or factor option would be $11.38, and that would be the residential exemption. The current tax rate is 11, residential tax rate is $11.65. The history of the rates is on the back of your book. Uh, the history, recent history of exemption amounts are on this slide. Fiscal last year, $1,954, the prior year, $1,890, and you see it's increased every year. The reason for that is because of the prior slide, the total residential values increased, but the parcel count really hasn't changed so um, as significantly. So what you end up with is a higher <coughs> residential um, exemption amount each year. We cannot go, however, we cannot go above 20%. Okay. Any questions on that? Um, there's some additional information on calculating the residential exemption um, in the second tab in your workbook, um, including the last page on that second tab will tell you the answer to a question I'm typically presented with, and that's what is the break even uh, number. In other words, because the residential exemption ap is applied only to residential property, it affects the residential rate, all right? So the residential exemption I in effect increases the residential rate to offset the amount of the exemption because the rate changed and then you apply the residential exemption at, in this case, uh, in this example that you have at the uh, 20%, the break-even value is 1,354,000, very near that average um, single family value. But what that means is any assessment, residential assessment above 1,354,000 actually has a net negative benefit of the residential exemption and any amount below that has a net positive effect, meaning a reduction in the net tax paid. I can tell you, based on a question uh, that came up recently, um, that the percentage of properties below the break-even, below the break-even is 85%. What was the number? 85. And, and the reason for that is because, you know, at the high end you have uh, residential properties that don't receive the residential exemption, the apartment buildings. So considering, you know, how to apply the residential exemption is one of the, what I call the basic four factors in des deciding the tax rate, right? Is the value changes, classification, the residential exemption, um, all get considered in there. So uh, to state it otherwise, the residential exemption essentially um, shifts taxes from um, condos and lower priced single families, among others, to higher priced single families and to apartments. Correct. 
I think the next uh, slide, uh, two slides, will demonstrate that on your workbook, uh, page eight. Slide, this is slide 16 here. So what this shows is that um, over this 10 year period, the green portion of the bar or the darker portion of the bar is the average single family tax. All right, the lighter or a reddish portion of the bar is the residential exemption on top of that, all right? Um, in other words, without the residential exemption, you'd be paying the higher amount, okay? So the residential exemption is the discount that brings you down to the darker bar. Right? So that's just single family. The next slide is just condominiums. So it's saying the darker bar is the actual tax on those properties, average condominium tax, and the lighter or red is the amount of the residential exemption or the discount. So as you can see, um, for that subclass, the condominiums, the benefit of the exemption is greater. It's a greater percent of the tax. And the reason for that is because the exemption is a flat amount, not a percentage of your tax. It's a flat amount for everyone. The only exception to that, <coughs> and there are a few cases where we need to apply the exception, and that's that you have to pay at least 10% of your real estate tax bill. So your residential exemption, say at $1,954, cannot reduce your real estate tax bill below 10% of its gross amount. So then it's adjusted. But otherwise, the residential exemption is not adjusted. It's applied in whole to all eligible tax courts. Currently, there are nearly 11,000 eligible tax courts receiving the residential exemption. There are 11,000 receiving the residential exemption. Um, does, that doesn't mean 11,000 are benefiting from it. Um, Correct. 85% are benefiting. Okay. Right. Now, uh, going back to this slide, because the, the, uh, there's 16,800 parcels in that residential class, and nearly 11,000 are receiving the residential exemption. Right. Right. If, okay. if the residential exemption were 10% as opposed to 20%, which would you, be an option. You, you could do that. We could do that. The benefit would be less, but you'd still have, would it still break at 85%, 15%? I, I, I can probably do the math. Are we? Uh, we think yes. Pardon? We think yes, it would. Yeah, okay. right. The tax rate would be lower. Right. So, the, so the, right. the benefit would still break down 85-15, but it would reduce the rate, uh, overall rate. It would reduce that delta, basically. Correct. Yeah. Which would reduce the total without it, and that's because the rate would be reduced. The residential tax rate would be reduced. Right. Because the residential tax rate has to increase when you take the exemption out. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, I'm just wondering if it would break at the same point. Our first, okay. our first thinking is that it would, but we certainly okay. want to look at that and okay. test it. Right. We may have it in the prior years, but we certainly we do that, we test that if, if that's something you're interested in. Okay. <coughs> I, I am going to move on from the residential exemption to a, a couple more slides. The next is apartments and commercials. Um, apartment and multifamily. So anything, any property with four units or more up to you know, 500, all right? So they're, they're in this group. 15% of those receive the residential exemption. Four units or more, all right? Uh, the median multifamily uh, assessment uh, apartment is 1.9 million, and the, the tax last year for that median property was 20,700. So these are the tax bills at the various rate options or factors uh, at the 173 that we well, applied last year, the increase would be $997 or 4.8 percent, about what the total value of that class increased, nearly 5 percent. For commercial property, there's zero residential exemption, right? For all the commercial portions not eligible, the median commercial assessment, 1.1 million, tax very similar um, to uh, the median apartment, although for uh, different reasons, a lower value, a higher rate. Um, a 1.73 factor would increase that tax by $1,200 or 5.9%. 5 so that's how you read that chart. And again, there's additional information in tab two, sheet B, meaning 
um, without the residential exemption, before residential exemption. All right, the last, uh, the last slide is informational that uh, we provide. It's the number, because we're talking about property taxes, um, one of the provisions of the system we have is that there's exemptions for different taxpayers uh, for um, eligibility criteria like, um, for example, I have them up here. Um, surviving spouse and minors, uh, veterans, visually impaired, elderly, or seniors. These are the number of exemptions applied um, in the most recent fi complete fiscal year, fiscal year 13, uh, and the amount of the exemptions applied. Uh, the reason we have a subtotal here for all classes of 129, those, those are reimbursable, at least partly reimbursable by the state. Uh, we have additional exemptions, uh, the deferral, we now have 10 taxpayers in the deferral, up from five just a couple years ago. Um, so that's tax that's deferred to be paid at a later time with interest. And our very successful senior work off abatements, we now have 25 participants in that heading towards 30 um, at a maximum of $1,000 apiece. That's not reimbursable. So that's a summary of our exemptions. You know, we continue to work with the Council on Aging and the Senior Center, particularly um, on uh, promoting those exemptions. So that's all the information I have in slide format. Be certainly happy to answer any questions. Uh, uh, you know, Dr. Peterson's here, or Rashid's here, if there's technical questions or uh, questions based on um, you know history of what we've done in the past, Selectman Banker. Yeah, if, um, if we put, and, and obviously we can't do it visually, but uh, the information on slides 12, 13, and 18 together, um, uh, you, if we stayed at our current 1.73, um, maybe, maybe the best slide to bring up would be slide 12. I can tell you in the tab two, that, that's done for you. Okay, do you have do those? You are have I don't have it as a slide, yeah. uh, but tab two has that information for you, kind of all yeah, those just the comparison, you know, at, at 1.73, um, if, if we stood pat, you'd have uh, an increase in the median commercial of 5.9%, single family 1.4%, two family 2.9%, 2.7 for condos and 2.5 for three families. So uh, because, I mean, if, if we're looking at smoothing this, um, just looking at, at this metric, it could lead you to, to one conclusion, um, which would be actually reducing the classification to 1.70 um, or something like that. And in the past, I've... Um, ask that we look at these numbers in various ways, that we not just look at the median, but we also uh, look at the, um, uh, at, at essentially breaking out the numbers within. And I think that might be particularly appropriate this year. I, if particularly if large commercial properties are driving this, I think we might want to be looking at some of the uh, measurements that I sent you in the email today that, we, that I've looked at in the past, but also uh, sort of the, what the quartiles and the deciles are within, particularly within the commercial properties, um, and whether uh, you, you'd really, what kind of impact you would see um, on the large properties, on the smaller commercial properties. Uh, and I'm wondering if if we can make any progress on that tonight or if, if that's for another day? Uh, well, my response is yes. To uh, present additional information on the change in the tax, as you've requested, we'll prepare that and make that available to you. Uh, the, the reason we don't include that information here is it assumes that we know the tax rate and we don't, all right, for this year. Uh, so taking uh, a median, I mean, at certain options, I understand that. But it focuses on the tax amount based on a rate. And historically, what we've done is focused on the assessment, the median or the average assessment, depending right. on looking in between or within a, a class, all right? Um, but we can go beyond that and say, okay, if this is what we vote for a tax rate, what would happen? Uh, I can tell you, um, Selectman Banker, that within that commercial class, again, the highest quartile increased 11% in value, the lowest quartile, three. So the change in tax is going to show you that same kind of. Yeah, yeah, and, and um, 
but we know that. And yet, yeah, and yet right. I, I guess we get the median increasing uh, by 5.9% at 1.73, right? So Correct. that that shows that commercial have been right. increasing. Right, and it doesn't reflect on all the commercial class. I understand that because there was a non-uniform change in values um, in that that class of property. Correct. Mm -hmm. Where there are more uniform change in the residential classes of property, right? And right. you know the, the 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 factors behind that are uh, the Longwood Medical Area reaching into Brookline in a significant way, particularly at Brookline Place. So you know that uh, has created uh, desirability in that location and and increased the value of of those properties to investors. So. Uh, you didn't see, you know, we don't see that across the entire commercial um, uh, base, <laughs> just in certain areas and certain properties. S yeah. I I'm understand your interest in this, Selectman Benka, but since we can't apply a different rate to different parcels, it's not clear to me where it takes us. Um, no, the, the, question, the question is, uh, if you... And, and we saw, and this may not be the case this year because of the dramatic, relatively dramatic increase in commercial values. Um, but um, last year, if you if you look at the impacts of the tax classification at various levels, um, and you're trying to, if if a goal is to smooth the impact on residential, commercial, and so forth, um, you could, um, you can get different results based on whether you look at the impact on the median property, you can get, if you look at the average tax increase divided by the value of the average property, you can get a different result. I think last year, for example, um, we had, um, uh, the, the commercial increasing in the, the median commercial property increasing, but also a number of commercial properties decreasing in their taxes. So the, the dispersion is different. And uh, I think just looking at one measure, the, the impact on the median property um, might lead to a conclusion that wouldn't really speak to all of the properties within the class. Uh, I don't disagree. I mean, I can, there are s uh, s individual commercial properties where there's been no change in value. Yeah. So uh, the total change in tax will be based on what happened to the rate. So if the rate it goes down, there's actually going to be a decrease in tax. That's correct. So there are property specific adjustments that aren't, aren't reflected in the median or the average on both the high and the, and the low side. And, and a, a more detailed analysis would certainly show that. I mean, what I'm, right. uh, for example, uh, 10 Brookline Place uh, was assessed at about $60 million, 61, 62, Correct. 63 million, and recently sold for 120 or 121 million. I assume, does, does this reflect a change in its assessment? It does. To what now? 92 million. Okay. Um, you know, right. and perhaps arguably even more. Uh, well, uh, you know, we could we could certainly talk about that, but you know, that's uh, where we are. Uh, there was and, some work done at this property. There's growth there. There's a change in lease terms. There's a change in ownership. Yeah, yeah. and and that probably also affects similar properties uh, like 830 and 850 Boylston Street. 850. 850 Boylston. Street? I'll agree with 850. Right. It's a similar desirability. It's a high end, uh, you know, a class A medical office building. Right. Um, that's a that's a convenient to Longwood Medical Area. But um, that, w but I think probably the um, the political concern on this board would be what is the impact on the small commercial property and the small commercial property owner? Uh, and again, that that lowest quartile changed three percent. Yeah, yeah, and so I'd, I'd sort of like to tease that information yeah. out and and see. Uh, um, because that, I think, would be the concern, and I, and I think right. people would say, hey, uh, these large office buildings are perhaps still underassessed at, 
you know, if, if the sale price is 120 million, um, you know. Well, we, we do recalculate assessments every year. Yeah, right. yeah. But yeah. Why, why is the assessment so far below the sale price? Uh, that's a, a good question. I'll, I'll attempt to answer that. The assessment's based on the income stream um, to that property uh -huh. and what we believe is an uh, accurate capitalization rate to, to convert that income stream to value. Um, what a recent group of real estate investors, global real estate investors, felt you know, they could get out of that property may be something a little different. Um, I think uh, as we move forward, we'll begin to see that uh, a little bit more. Um, it's not unlike the purchase of Dexter Park uh, a couple years ago. Um, you know, we had an opportunity to talk to the investor of that property, what they were thinking, what they were expecting to get out of it. And you know, as, as we've learned more, we've been able to um, show that in our assessment. You know, prior to that, I'd point to the sale of Longwood Towers for 110 million um, to another uh, global real estate investment company, and you know, and that failed. Yeah. Um, you know, a third of that property sold at 20 million dollars several years later. So, you know, there's risks taken by real estate investors. Some are successful um, in, uh, investments, some are not. Um, we'll learn more about that um, property, but I think what's underlying it is desirable tenants now with long-term uh, leases favorable to the property owner. So, to right. yeah, uh, just right. as, uh, Chairman DeWitt, to, to try to wrap up the answer to your question, um, I think that there is so much variation within the commercial class and uh, the uh, impacts that um, might happen to individual properties within that class that I think it's, it's, it's probably important for this board to see what's actually happening on the ground with respect to the large commercial properties and the small commercial properties that, you know, in many cases form the backbone of the small commercial areas in town. Right, and, and I'll agree with Selectman Benka that uh, having a, a, more, a, a bit more detail and striation within the commercial will help me get to where I think we should be with the, with the shift. Sure, we could provide that information. Thank you. Okay, um, other questions for members of the board? This is a public hearing. Is there anyone here who wishes to ask a question or comment on the presentation from the assessor with regard to tax classification? Yes, sir, Mr. Leary, you're welcome. Good evening, Chairman DeWitt, members of the board. After having to wade through all of that information and data, <laughs> I will be brief. Uh, I'm here this evening uh, representing the Brookline Chamber of Commerce. Uh, my name is uh, Richard T. Leary. Uh, and first, I'd like to express the Chamber's appreciation for the Board's actions over the past few years in setting the CIP factor at 1.73. In reviewing all of the hearing material, and I've had an opportunity to, uh, to look at the various uh, uh, charts, uh, there would appear to be no compelling reason to change the factor for FY14. When you exclude the substantial value increases associated with the medical office properties at one Brookline Place, 10 Brookline Place West, and 850 Boylston Street, the increase in commercial property value is approximately the same as the increase in residential property values of 5%. Last year's increases were 1.60 for residential and 2.29% for commercial. So they were relatively, uh, relatively close. We were happy to hear that with the exception of general office space, commercial vacancy rates decreased uh, over the period. Now, at a shift of 1.73, and I'm um, repeating some of these data that Mr. McCabe has given you, the median single family tax increase would be $151, or 1.4%, while the median commercial tax increase would be $1,210, or 5.9%. The tax rate reduction, and it's nice to have one for a change, 
would be minus 2.34% for residential and 1.90% for commercial. Uh, in closing, I would like to note that uh, when Brookline adopted classification uh, many years ago, the town's commercial valuation was between 15 and 20% of the total valuation. It has been below 10% of the total for at least the last 15 years. Very few other comparable towns with commercial values under 10% have adopted classification. So the chamber would be most appreciative if you would set the CIP factor at 1.73% for FY14. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on this subject? Yes, please identify yourself for the record. Sarah Lynn Allaire and I'm town meeting member from Precinct 16. And I just want to speak out uh, for lower income seniors who are trying to live in their homes and particularly if we'll probably get a tax e increase this year and then with the overrides coming, I think some consideration should be given to help and support people living in their, in their homes. Um, we've seen from Mr. Cave's presentation, there is a small program to enable seniors who can work to do some work to re reduce their tax income um, tax rate, but um, it's particularly with the overrides, I don't think that's gonna go very far, plus uh, majority of uh, lower income seniors can't do the work. So I don't know how many it applies to, not too many. Um, and I would suggest that doing something to support um, seniors, lower income seniors living in their home would do two things in addition to helping them. Uh, and the first would be to um, help uh, lower the, I'm gonna say lower, but keep stable at any rate the burgeoning school population. And uh, the second thing is I think it would help preserve income uh, diversity since uh, many of these people are probably living in uh, more moderately priced housing, and, and it would keep that moderate pricing, house pricing available at least for a number of years. So I hope something could be done, whether it's a elimination of some fees or some other consideration. I um, hope that that will be done. Thank you. I, I would just add that we are constrained by state law in terms of the exemptions that uh, we can give, and my understanding is that we are basically up to the maximum in terms of uh, exemptions for lower income people or lower income lower income residents or for or seniors, seniors right. under 41 but, but what kind of exemptions are you talking about you mean the the, um, the, 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 the things that mr. McCabe was listing yes, right exactly. I'm doing talking about maybe something like reducing some fees or eliminating some fees that's not part of the tax system no, but no, she raises but an interesting point that's something we could consider, for instance, the, the, the trash fee right. or something like yeah, that. It's something that we could consider, which would not be part of our vote right. on the tax rate, um, but an idea, and I thank you for it. Right. Yeah. Regina Foley, town meeting member, also from Precinct 16. Um, thank you, Nancy. Uh, for appreciating that because I, I really have to point out that even when they increased the tax workout program, another $250, it was washed away by the increase in the taxes that year. So we're kind of, uh, since then we have a water meter fee, that's $200 a year for having the water meter. What do seniors do? <laughs> they cut back on the water. We have a higher rate because we use less. <laughs> we have a kind of got seniors boxed in. And anything, uh, what we need really are heroes. And the political will for that comes out of the Board of Selectmen. The ability to implement it certainly rests with Mel Kleckner, the town administrator, but the political will for it comes out of you guys. And I speak for a precinct that's 40% seniors over the age of 60 in my precinct alone living in single family homes and the major overwhelming majority are on fixed incomes and they are 
as I can attest from just our socials that we have, that they have health issues. They have, they're on Medicare, met most of them with the supplements and they're paying as much as 100 or more a month for one pill because that's the name of various insurance programs. So we're, we're really um, not treasuring, you don't mean to not treasure the seniors, but we're not valuing how valuable they are staying in their homes the most we can keep them there because every one of them, when people come to buy our homes, is going to be people with children going to the schools. So you have a net gain by keeping us in our home. And I'm looking for the political will to, and it does belong in this conversation, even if you can't adjust the uh, <coughs> thing, although Selectman Banker raised an interesting idea when he said we ought to be looking at small business versus big business. Um, you could look at small, limited income people living in their home and they can do income proof versus people who are quite wealthy, who are seniors. Um, yeah, you don't have I to give it across I the board. I think that's the part we're not allowed to do under the, the well, we real do estate have, We do have tax. deferrals and we do have people who are means tested. Yeah. I mean, and one of the things that we've done over the years is increase outreach so that people who qualify under means tested exemptions will come forward, which were, was not the case mm -hmm. years ago. Yeah, but maybe uh, we can have uh, m uh, Mr. McCabe explain a little bit about those two programs that we do have. Yeah, uh, but back to the fee kind of thing, y you can have a means test for that. Uh, you don't have to get take away all fees for everyone of a right. certain age, but it's reasonable to say, but we value the people who grew this town. Well, the fees are more within our control, so that yeah, certainly is yeah. something for discussion. So group. it comes down to anything in the world mm -hmm. that you can do to help the seniors stay in this, forever, if they possibly mm -hmm. could, in their homes. Um, to paraphrase a nurse, uh, when I was a patient advocate for someone in intensive care, and I brought him back to thank the nursing staff, and I said, do you recognize us? Well, I recognize you, but he'd have to lie down and see the bottom of his feet for me to recognize him. Um, I, don't wa I want us to go out the same way as uh, that kind of thing, where we live in our homes until we're ready not to live anywhere. So anything in the world uh, you can do to be a hero for seniors, uh, I would be grateful. Thank you. Uh, Selectman Daly, I, c I can offer a few things. Uh, the uh, deferral program uh, is a temporary exemption. And you know, it's a program that uh, we promote heavily. We've increased it from five to 10, but certainly that sh there could be more uh, because the town eventually will get that tax revenue back when the property's transferred. So, um, you know, we, we offer that when, when seniors call. But one of the challenges of those uh, programs, uh, the means test, as uh, Chairman DeWitt mentioned, is both income and asset tax. And, and you know, the meeting both of those criteria is, is difficult. Uh, for many of our homeowners. Um, we can point to the senior work off as an example where we have 25 uh, taxpayers in that program. There's only an income test, not an asset test, or what the law calls whole estate. So if you could eliminate the whole estate portion of the test, I think you would see more seniors eligible as evidenced by the work off program. But the fact is we can't. You know, the, you must include both the whole estate and the income test. So we'll continue to look at opportunities to raise those levels to allow uh, more seniors in um, as time goes along. But that seems to be the, the biggest challenge, the dual test. And the senior exemption, I think people have to be quite elderly to take advantage Seven. of that. Seven Correct. Oh, that's years of age. Not that elderly. Not that elderly. <laughs> <laughs> Are, I agree. Is, <laughs> is, is there, um, uh, the, there are 25 uh, seniors who are uh, taking advantage of the, the work off uh, uh, program. Um, are there any unmet demands there? Are, are, are there any people who said, I'd like to do it, and they, there was a cap that prevented them from doing it? Uh, I believe there are. Uh, okay. We've expanded that program to 30 for fiscal year 14, and I, and I think we're going to get there. So um, you know, one of the uh, commitments that the Board of Assessors made together with the Council on Aging is each year to look at our capacity to manage more 
eligible taxpayers in that program. There's a couple of other components, just not eligibility. It's their skill set, will they fit into a position within town government that's available, and the entire program needs to be managed. Right now it's managed by the jobs coordinator um, at the senior center on a part-time basis. Okay. So w what eventually may happen, Selectman Bank, is we'll butt up against our ability to manage the program. And we haven't yet, you know, we're, we're, we're going to see how 14 goes with 30, and we'll, we'll okay. look beyond that. Okay, thank you. All right, I do we have any other? Yeah, I, 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 I had just asked the town administrator, and, and my recollection is actually that the water fee, I, I don't think it's true of the refuse fee, but I do believe the water fee is linked to one of the senior um, income-based exemptions. Is, is that? That's correct. It's a 20% um, a discount on your water fee if you're eligible for either the 41C or the 17D exemption. So on this chart uh, above here, the, the surviving spouse and minors or the 41C el elderly, so there's 13 taxpayers who are receiving a 20% discount on their water fee. Uh, you can't, on its own merit, qualify for the water discount without going through the property tax exemption. You have to be an owner of the property. If, um, if somebody qualifies uh, for the property tax exemption, is that automatically applied to the water fee? It is. Our, so we administer system? that. Okay, There's no separate application. They don't have to separately. Okay, that. Okay. Correct. And I, my understanding, having participated or at least witnessed that discussion, was the intent was to sort of offset that that higher rate exactly. at the lower consumption level. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. I mean, the the other the other fee or the other use fee that we have is the trash fee, uh, the solid waste fee. Um, but other than that, I don't think there's. I don't any think we have very many options. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Are we ready to move on? Then thank you, Mr. Thank McCabe, you. and all of your uh, assistants. We appreciate your very thorough and detailed presentation, and furthermore, your willingness to go back and recalculate everything if we ask you to do more. <laughs> so uh, I guess we'll see you again next week. That would be fine. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, next item is a presentation. Um, from our human relations and our human resources department, but we are going to hear um, wait until the Classification things are cleared away. <laughs> so welcome, Mr. Jelano. Hi. And I just will say as an introduction that this is a presentation. We're not going to take a position on this. Um, we assume that um, this could be a topic for, in fact, I believe is on the agenda for the this uh, Committee on Diversity and Equal Opportunity and Affirmative Action, so um, it will go to that committee for some discussion and we'll probably hear from you again. Um, so we're not planning to take any action, we just want to hear from you. Okay. And um, I would also like to observe that this is a collaboration uh, between Health and Human Services and Human Resources, and I guess the first product uh, since town meeting voted to create the position that you now occupy. That is correct. So we welcome you here in your capacity as the direct, I'm sorry, you're the uh, Human Relations and Human Services Administrator. Yes, that's correct. Well, thank you for having us here this evening to actually talk about the document. Um, I think everyone has copies at this point. Yep. Okay. Um, before I get started, I just want to actually acknowledge um, Sandra DeBow, actually the um, HR director, and then actually uh, the staff member, um, Rebecca jo um, Jokum, in the back there. Please Hello, stand up. Rebecca. <laughs> You're allowed to come and sit in the front if you like. <laughs> um, 
she has put in a lot of work in putting this document together um, through its many changes and um, probably continued changes in the future. Um, I also want to state that this is a, uh, a living document, meaning that it's going to change over the course of time. New, new techniques and new ways of reaching folks are out there. We're planning to include it in the document. Um, I also want to say this is a, another example of what I became to appreciate in, in the town of um, the collaborations between the different departments to put something together like this. And um, it's a great piece of work and I'm looking forward to actually more a further collaboration with other departments as well as with Sandra in the future. Um, so the question I have is um, why do we need this blu uh, blueprint? Um, and for me there are several different reasons. Uh, first of all, it's a document that, that demonstrates the town's commitment to diversifying its workplace, in particular for upper management. We know that that's been a concern in the town for, um, for a while, and I think the efforts that um, our, our town has made, um, although it's not as successful as we would like them to be, the fact are that we are taking strides and in, in a, in a big effort to actually make that happen. Um, it's, a, it's a work in progress. Um, it also provides the town with a process that may increase the diversity of the applicant pool. That's pretty obvious. Um, it provides a minimum standard for recruiting efforts that may lead to a diverse applicant pool and, again, the potential of hiring of minorities in upper ma uh, management positions. I think a real important part of that is because of the sort of, um, I'm going to say, qua quasi-standardization at this point, um, it allows the town to periodically review each step of the recruiting process and to see what's working and what's not and modify those things as, as, as appropriate. Um, and again, it goes to the emphasis this is a living document. We'll change it. Uh, you also will notice that it's over 22 pages long. Um, the funny thing about it is it only one and a half pages are actually the process. The rest of it is a listserv, which uh, Rebecca did a remarkable job, job of pulling together. Uh, listing various organizations that um, represent different diverse groups in, our, in the community um, in, in Massachusetts and abroad. So how was the um, blueprint developed? Um, we started the process actually in early May, uh, looking at what the town was doing um, and pulling out those things that were working. And then we started looking at what other towns and um, businesses were doing at the time. Um, we also had some discussions with some high-level folks who actually um, do a lot of work in um, recruiting diverse staff, um, staff folks. We, in addition, again, this is where the collaboration comes from. We actually talked to human um, resources. We also talked to town council. We talked to actually um, the health department, which actually has a very diverse staff. And we, you know, we were looking, like, okay, what do we do to sort of promote this? And I think um, a good example, uh, we're a good example of how the approach actually works. Um, in fulfilling uh, Rebecca's position with Chris uh, Chanislokit, we actually looked at the job description and the job announcement and we made modifications. And I must say that we had a lot of minority candidates who applied for the job. In fact, I would say the, of the eight final candidates, the majority of them were min of minority. Um, so it does, the system does work. It could be, though, that you know, the nature of the work, though, um, there tend to be more minorities and stuff that go in that position, too. But the fact of the matter, we got a big pool, and we're really pleased by that. All right, I, just, uh, I want to end on the key strength, the strengths of the blueprint, uh, because I think it's pretty self-evident what we do in there. But it provides an extensive listing of organizations that the town can send job announcements. Um, and that works both ways, I'm sorry. It works both ways. Uh, we can get, um, you know, from HR, we can actually take those do um, uh, job announcements and, um, and actually keystroke, just send them to all these organizations. But it works on the flip side, too. If we know of someone who's looking to hire in the town, it's just as another town employee, but, um, you know, um, all the businesses and organizations in the town, we can actually take that resume and send it and broadcast it to these folks as well. So it works both ways. And again, it's, it provides a mechanism to evaluate and modify job announcements and postings to 
encourage underrepresented populations to apply for town positions. Uh, I think that's really key to have a monitoring um, process in there. Now, it doesn't go into detail who's going to do that at this point because I think that's the nature of your, um, one of the things that your um, committee is looking at, who's going to do this and, and when and how. So um, it does allow for that kind of expansion. Lastly, it encourages department heads and others to involve in hiring staff to diversify their screening and interview committee processes when, whenever possible. And we have been doing that. Um, I actually sat on one for the water for DPW. And I do believe at this point um, that um, town council, uh, there are some folks um, uh, of a diverse nature in um, that's going to be sitting on that, um, um, those committees, those search committees. So th we're doing some good things. And I actually watched the selectmen actually on a couple um, situations actually talk and say, are you sure you're going to be reaching um, a diverse population and recruiting? And I think that's applauded. And I think that's a lot of the groups want to see that upper level investment. I think that's happening now too. So um, that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Sandra. She's got anything um, that she wanted to add. And I'll take questions afterwards. Thank you. Again, I'd just like to echo that I think that this is a great idea. Um, when we were going to out for town council, we went to the places that we would normally go, but then just to get a broad um, ar array of a whole variety, we were able to send it to Rebecca, and with one push of a button, or maybe a couple, um, it went out to all these other associations. And so um, particularly for uh, position like the town council where you really are trying to get as broad a group as possible for a very specific type of um, professional uh, person, I think that this is a really good approach to take. So it's fabulous that um, someone has helped us expand our network tenfold. Um, I think there's still a lot of work to be do doing and establishing um, networks one-on-one -on -one like we have been doing, but I feel like this has just uh, flung us forward um, with a lot of work by Rebecca, but it will hopefully be easy to upkeep. And, and like Lloyd said, it is a living, breathe breathing um, document that we expect to be changing over time. So that's it. Questions? Uh, obviously, please, please come forward. I should actually um, comment on other, you know, the Human Relations Commission actually um, was part of this process too. I don't want to leave them out because they're a very important part of it. We did run it by them and they actually gave us um, some um, candidates or um, people to put on our list there. So it's really important and um, we just want to thank them for their, their efforts on this as well. Oh, so. very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Selectman Daly? Yeah, more of a comment. I'm very pleased uh, to see your, you launch this effort and thank you, Rebecca. And I wanna say, Mr. Kleckner, I'd like to keep Rebecca. Um, but I, and I, I, I did put it on the agenda tomorrow night for the, the Selectman's Diversity and Equal Opportunity and Affirmative Action Committee to take a look at it. Cause we actually had a very interesting discussion one night by Grace Lee, one of the committee members. And I think unfortunately, maybe neither of you were able to be there that night. This was a while ago. But uh, she has actually done a lot of this work in various positions she had. And I thought one of her, one of her interesting ideas was it's, it's not geared toward those uh, top of the department jobs, but she was very <coughs> um, suggested strongly that we consider um, some internship programs for maybe underprivileged uh, teenagers or whatever. And that you know you begin to develop a pool that comes into your, you know, later thinks of coming into your workforce. And um, you know, as, as we have seen historically, Brookline likes to promote from within. So you need to have people at all levels, you know, with diversity so that, you know, they can move up that ladder. And uh, that's I one idea I'd love to see. Um, Reference in I'm there. smiling because we're, we're on the same page here. Actually, um, Rebecca actually has um, helped us develop a sort of a protocol to do outreach to actually folks in the MECO program as well as Steps to Success. Um, um, I think it's a, and in particular, maybe focusing on the department heads actually visiting with these groups every now and then um, to um, tell them about the, their department 
as well as letting them know what career, career choices are involved with that too. So yeah, we're on the same page with that. Right. So. And she was saying, I mean, even if those people don't come to work for the town, they go out and say, hey, I had a great experience, you know, in, in the town of Brooklyn. So mm -hmm. yeah. And um, s she had she had some other ideas. So I, I think we'll have some some more suggestions for you after we take a look at it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Edmund Wyshynski. Um, a mechanical question. You know, part of getting this to work is the creation and maintenance of, of the listserv. Um, and there's a lot of email addresses on here, and that's great. But it, it's that's got to be living too, because uh, people move on, organizations change, new organizations. So, wh what processes, procedures do you have in place to deal with bounces? changes in email address, keep, keeping this thing current. Interns, interns, interns. <laughs> 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 Rebecca, 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 I can see her. Yeah, we're aware of that too. And uh, like you said, it, it's a living document. And when things change, we'll add. And if we get bounce backs, we'll deal with that too. We, we'll, if we have to make phone calls to see if it's still an active site or not, we'll do that. Yes, Selector and Binkham. Yeah, I, I actually um, was following up on that question. Um, there are about two, about a page and a half to two pages of GLBTQ organizations, almost all with email addresses, and about a half a page of um, African American organizations' information, um, not with email addresses, with, with one exception. And, um, you know, obviously at this point, so much of the dissemination of information is by email. And uh, if it goes in hard, co even if it goes in hard copy to uh, a recipient, that becomes very difficult for that recipient to further distribute to his or her email list. And I'm, um, I, question number one is, um, are we working on filling in uh, email addresses so that information really can get out uh, to all of the organizations here and to all of their members or their email lists um, easily. And so that's question number one. Mm -hmm. uh, it it kind of surprised me that you know there there was that um, that gap here. Yeah, I noticed that too, but I think if you look back in the religious organization information, and you will find that a number of those are, um, and maybe Rebecca or whoever put this list together can answer that, but I believe a number of the religious organizations are um, probably associated with the African American community. And in fact, at that s same meeting I'm referencing before, Grace Lee mentioned that when she is recruiting, she has had some churches in, in the African-American community that she would reach out to to get those job postings um, more widely yeah. out there. So I think, I guess that, I guess that's a kind of recognized way yeah. to do it. Yeah. For so can I, can I just make a comment on that? Mm -hmm. So we can only, um, you know, work with the information we have. Yeah. And and part and and because we're going to be using this document on a regular basis, we will be getting bounce backs. Um, currently, we're sending out cards that ask people when they apply. You know, where do they hear from this? Mm -hmm. um, that will become automated when we have our applicant tracking software up and going. So that's just another way of tracking. You know, are we primarily drawing from here and, and not there and those type of analysis. But also this is another part, another level of networking that if we don't have good contact information, this is something that we should continue to reach out to these organizations. Right. And it's not a bad thing if we start getting bounce backs and we're reaching out and connecting with these individuals. Um, I think that there's every effort going to be made to keep this document up to date and as current and um, successful as possible. No, I, n I uh, it's uh, Select and Daily, I uh, completely agree with you. Th you know, the, um, the, the religious organizations, um, uh, you know, Columbia
Columbus Avenue, African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, the Ebenezer Baptist Church, and so forth. Um, but again, um, many of those do not have email addresses. And my only just a suggestion is that so much communication is by email nowadays that it would probably be, as this list gets developed, worth a call to these yeah. or, and say, what, what's the best email? And, and uh, we follow through well, on that. Yeah, no, I think it's important to get those email addresses. But interestingly, Grace also said at that meeting that when she is looking to fill a position, she has a certain number of people that she actually picks up the phone and calls. And you know, some people that she knows might make an effort to find some good candidates. And uh, so being something of a Luddite myself, I was happy to hear that some people <laughs> still use the phone. The, um, the other comment in, in that regard is um, I, I note that under uh, the GLBTQ organizations, there are a couple of student organizations, uh, UMass and Northeastern. I would assume that there are similar organizations uh, at our local universities uh, for um, other minority uh, candidates that would uh, should be on this list as it gets developed. Yeah, uh, we agree. Okay, other comments, questions? I, I have a question. Um, and I, I'm guessing it's Ms. DeBeau who's going to answer this for me. Um, it would be helpful, I think, for all of us to hear something about what I'm going to call the constraints on municipal hiring um, that come about from civil service, from collective bargaining agreements. In other words, there are, um, in public safety, you wouldn't be able even to use this list, correct? Um, and for police and fire, That's you're talking about exactly. police, police and fire, police right. officers, and firefighters. But we have a lot of civilians who work, um, particularly in the police department, and we've had a lot of success of getting um, employees at in different levels to come up through the department into the police ranks. I mean, I think that we have a number of dispatchers and meter collection folks who are going through the process and are on the next test. So I think we have to really look at it broadly. Yes, there are civil service um, exams for the police and the fire and they have residency preferences. Um, that is primarily the limitation though and we really take, try to take advantage of the, um, the fact that we are no longer covered by civil service. Well, uh, for, for the non-public safety, I was just really asking you to give, uh, and, and fine, you should elaborate on that. I really wanted to hear where it is that there are restrictions on how much outreach we can do. And I do understand that under civil service, we, we are very limited. For police, police, for police and, and fire officers. Which is the only okay. civil service positions we have yeah. anymore. Right. Yeah, but I, I think there, uh, well, first, one thing, we do give the veterans preference for police and fire, yep. and that has actually been a great source of uh, more diverse candidates coming right. in in recent years, which has been helpful. But I also think that um, you know maybe it would not be a bad thing to somehow w get this information out more to people that they need to go take that exam if they want to be even considered, because yes. I think that's one of the problems. Right. That's why we've had this whole situation where, you know, it's been family members of, of other people uh, going well, to I take that exam because people don't realize you have to go take that exam but and I, I you have to get into this civil service process if you want one of those jobs. Yes. So that's why the police chief took that article to town meeting which yeah. got passed and, and which uh, the state, you know, refused to which, allow which us to Which the article act. was to which give a preference to Brookline High School graduates that would include Metco students and others. Right. Right? That's not the way I would frame it, but yes, okay. that would be the effect. <laughs> um, there are a lot of other, yes. Um, and uh, the chief, the chief of police did, um, 
an incredible amount of recruiting um, in the community and at the police department. He was at Brookline Day. So I really think that the department is trying to get that um, people uh, to apply. They also work very closely with employees or, or uh, people who are interested, and it includes minority applicants as well, that if they want to move in, you know, they, they actually put put individuals together or students that they know want to come up, put them together and say, you know, look for this, this type of housing and here's a roommate, here's somebody else who's interested. So they do a lot of work. And I think that if you look at the classes that have come through, you'll see the result of that. All I wanted to do was point out that there are some areas where we have less ability to do the kind of outreach that we would like to do. That's true. I, I agree with you, but I, I think that there's more that we can still do, and, and we are continuing to work in Great. those areas. Good. Uh, Mr. Clark, are you? No, I'm, I'm good now. Okay. Uh, question for whom? Um, you have to come forward. I don't think we're here to interrogate the presenters, though, just to be clear. I, I just have two questions. Does the blueprint cover diversity in the interview committees? Yes, the answer yes. is. It says so. Don't you have a copy? I don't have a copy. I'm sorry, we'll get you one. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, the next question is, uh, the software for human resources uh, had been talked about for at least uh, three or four years. And I just heard that it may be uh, coming, and I'd like to ask when, if so. The information, that, uh, the human resources information system that you're talking about was a different type of software. And we are currently implementing a new um, payroll system that has an applicant tracking component. So once we can get our employees paid with this new system, we will be doing the applicant tracking, which we anticipate will probably be around March. And that's because we knew there was going to be this delay. That's why we started using these updated cards that we've been using. But, but I should say, and I, Sandra, I think you may have found this too, that I myself have spoken to some people who are employees and they feel that they do not want to identify themselves as a minority, a protected class. They feel, I've spoken to several people who said, you know, I got my job on the merits. I don't want to be putting myself down on, on any records in some kind of um, category like that because I feel like I'm qualified for the job and I shouldn't have to say that. So. There, I, and that's what I have found talking to some people. So I'm and, the, and there's a huge generational effect. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, we have to collect this data for EEO purposes. We have to, every other year, submit numbers. Um, we are trying to look at race, diversity, and inclusion in a much more dynamic way than just numbers. Um, and again, there is an enormous there is an enormous generational effect as to who am I, who, we could talk about this for hours. But at the end of the day, it is helpful to collect that information as to where people um, are applying from, what sources they're using, so that we can make sure that we're hitting the largest possible swath of people that we can. Right. But I'm just saying that even at the end of the day, if people don't want to put themselves down in certain categories, that data may not be completely accurate. I can guarantee the, gar the, the, the data is not accurate and the law allows people to uh, divulge that information or not. So we can't compel that information. It, it, it is not accurate. It is a guideline only. Right. Okay. okay. Um, any more? Oh, I just want to say thank you and, and thank you to Rebecca for such a wonderful job. It's, it's a good, great start and, you know, I hope we'll have some helpful suggestions for you to, to um, you know, and I'm sure as time goes on you'll be, you know, fleshing this out even more. Yes. Well, thank right. you. And, thank and you. we look forward to hearing about the next version.
Thank okay, mm -hmm. thanks very much. And I believe that's the last item on our calendar, so this concludes the meeting of the Board of Selectmen for Tuesday, December 3rd.